the Royal Commission into Violence, Abuse, Neglect and Exploitation of People with Disability is now in session. Yes, good morning, uh, everybody who is following these, uh, who may be following these proceedings. Uh, we commence with the acknowledgement of country and I invite Commissioner Mason to make that acknowledgement. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> we acknowledge the First Nations people as the original inhabitants of the lands on which this hearing is sitting. Nalanga, Jokuru, Runku, Kalyone, Anungu, Puaripa, Jara, Ninandia, Joda, Mora, Nyanga. We recognise Majin, Brisbane. Nanga Ngora Kantananyi Ngora Beijing Nga Brisbane Ta. We recognise the country north and south of the Brisbane River as the home of both the Cherubal and Jaguar nations. Nanga Ngora Kantananyi Karu Panya Brisbane River Nya Alanjara Muno Ovarira Arnongo Ngora Richa. Jora Ninanja Mono Kuari Ninanyi Jurabunga Mono Jagaruna. And we pay respect to the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. Their land is where the city of Sydney is now located. We also pay respect to the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, where the city of Melbourne is now located. We pay deep respects to all elders, past, present and future, and especially elders, parents, young people and children with disability. I'd now like to read the First Nations content warning. This hearing will include evidence that may bring about different responses for people. It will include accounts of violence, abuse, neglect and exploitation of First Nations children with disability and their experiences with child protection systems across Australia. First Nations viewers, please note that the evidence may describe trauma, including removal. And if the evidence raises concerns for you, please contact the National Counselling and Referral Service on one 800 421468. You can also contact Lifeline 13 11 14. Beyond Blue on 1300 224 636 or your local Aboriginal medical services for social and emotional wellbeing support. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner Mason. Yes, uh, Mr Crowley. Is it Mr Crowley? Yes, it is. Yes, Chair and Commissioners, the, um, this morning we will hear first the evidence of Ivy. Um, Ivy, who will provide evidence as a First Nations mother, speaking of uh, her experience as, as, as a mother of uh, a young girl with complex disability needs um, in out-of-home care. The evidence of Ivy will be dealt with by Ms Tarago. Um, Ivy will be giving her evidence here in the Brisbane Hearing Room, Commissioners. Um, she will soon be um, asked to attend. But uh, before we get to the evidence, I just wanted to raise two matters. Firstly, um, just to inform uh, Commissioners and other parties and those following that the evidence of Ivy is being presented to the Commission uh, as evidence of her experiences and her perspectives as a First Nations mother in relation to her and her daughter's experiences of out-of-home care, uh, in particular her daughter, Megan, as a First Nations child with disability in out-of-home care. Uh, Council assisting will not be urging the Commission to make particular factual findings in respect of the evidence of Ivy uh, and what she says about Megan. Uh, that being said, Commissioners, uh, Ms McMillan, Queen's Council, who appears for the State of Queensland, is present 
And I understand that Mr McMillan wishes to raise some matters with the Commission before we commence with the evidence of Ivy. Yes, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, Ms McMillan. Yes, thank you, Chair and Commissioners. Um, I'll be brief. Um, in terms of the evidence today, I understand you have um, correspondence that from uh, Crown Law in, um, with you dated the 20th of September and the 21st of September. Yes, um, I and I assume uh, my colleagues have uh, correspondence, including a document which is headed uh, response to Queensland, and that contains, I think, the issues that Queensland wishes to raise. Yes, thank you. Um, I'd also... I, I believe, just to be clear, that yes. there were uh, 12 issues and then cert, uh, and then a number of other issues raised as to particular paragraphs of Ivy's uh, statement. Yes, that was in the second letter, um, Chair, of the 21st of September. Now, yes. they refer to um, proposed notice, notices of proposed adverse findings, which were served on us on the 13th and 18th of August. Now, just chronologically, that was about a month before we only received Ivy's statement last week. Um, and in those notices, it should be um, not pointed out that at that time it was raised that the our client would call a witness in relation to it. That was never sought um, further after that time. So whilst there is some comfort to hear what senior counsel just said, we are somewhat confused that notices of possible adverse findings nonetheless remain there, which are... Um, relate to the Department of Child Safety, in short, children's health, and also the foster parents of this young child. Now, we are, with respect, somewhat confused about what the status then is if those notices remain in place. They're not going to be withdrawn. Um, so it places everybody in somewhat, we say, confusing and difficult position. Um, I would also uh, ask... Ms. 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 McMillan, can I Ms. just uh, interpose? I haven't seen, or I don't have in front of me anyway, that notice, but I would have thought on the basis of what Mr Crowley has just communicated that the notice has been superseded. If no findings are sought, it's difficult to see uh, how a notice of possible adverse findings can have any um, effect. Uh, Mr Crowley may wish to confirm that, but... Uh, it would seem to me that uh, whatever was in the original notice is superseded by Mr Crowley's uh, statement that he's just given. Yeah, thank you. Um, and uh, perhaps this is one of the unfortunate things that's occurred in a number of hearings where we receive adverse notices prior to any evidence so that uh, we're not really sure where things stand. Um, yeah. And I, I, I agree with you that uh, in an ideal world, everybody, including commissioners, should get statements well in advance. Well, yes, hearing Jim. and it's uh, it's uh, it's a difficulty, and it's a difficulty that I have to say is in part due to the sheer uh, complexities of organising these hearings. I'm not in the least critical of anybody. Uh, preparing the hearings, but uh, I understand that it can create a difficulty for parties who have um, been given leave to appear, and indeed it does, in a sense, create a difficulty for commissioners as well, because yes. uh, we have to uh, deal with the evidence in a way that respects uh, the party's entitlement to procedural fairness, and that therefore creates a limitation on uh, what we're able to do with the evidence that we are receiving. Yes, Chair. Um and no point has been taken about the late material, but it's really these notices that come well before. Um, we've we've taken issue before with them, and perhaps now's not the time to discuss the timing of them prior to any evidence. But I would ask the Chair and Commissioners to look at two documents, um, particularly an affidavit, and I'll give you the reference numbers. The first one is a child protection notification dated the 27th of August. 2019. Um, the reference is QLD.0003.0001. Now, do, and, do you want this 
brought up on a screen and is it to be a public um, document? Um, no, um, we've asked they be, that's already included in the tender bundle. The next document I'm about to refer to is not. I don't seek that they be put up on the screen for um, largely the reason that Commissioner uh, Mason's just mentioned the sensitivity of issues um, related therein. And I'm conscious of making these submissions. I don't want to descend into detail, um, being mindful of the sens sensitivity of some of these issues. Um, that affidavit is Rebecca Stain, the 11th of February 2021, QLD.0. Is, is that S T A I N? Yes, 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 it is, Chair. Thank you. QLD.003.0045 dot zero zero four five dot seven four three four that document in particular will give you it was as I say February this year but a good indication of where things currently stand. So I've had some discussions with both Mr Crowley and also Ms Tarago. I understand some uh, matters will be led which may give us some confidence comfort in terms of um, issues which we say are, and we said this in the correspondence, inaccurate um, and um, at complete odds with um, documentary evidence. So um, I'm loath to even seek to cross-examine. I don't, um, but I would want to just take instructions after we hear the yeah. evidence in chief. From what I understand, and I don't have <coughs> obviously personal knowledge of this, but it's been communicated, is that there would there may be a difficulty with cross examination in the sense of risk of re-traumatizing somebody. So there's a real there is a real issue there. Um, um, Ms. McMillan, I fully understand the issues that you're raising. Um, they're not novel. I don't mean in relation to Queensland, but we've had this kind of uh, issue arise previously. The way in which it's been dealt with in the past uh, has been that the evidence has been adduced, but with a clear understanding that no findings will be sought and that the evidence is disputed in material respect by whichever the represented party might be. So it may be yes. Queensland or it may be the Commonwealth or it may be another state or another agency. And I judge from what uh, Mr Crowley has said that that is the basis upon which this evidence is to be adduced. Yes. When, one, when one reads Ivy's statement, um, it fairly, uh, one could infer fairly readily that uh, the uh, state of Queensland and its agencies would not necessarily agree with the perceptions of Ivy. But in the light of what Mr Crowley has said, we won't be asked to make any findings, we won't make any findings, and the evidence will be received on the understanding that Queensland does dispute some of the uh, factual matters and perhaps some quite important factual matters. Thank, thank you, Chair. And, and we've also raised, and this is one of the unsatisfactory things, is that whilst no doubt a direction will be made for us to be able to put further evidence in, reputationally the damage done, for instance, to people like the foster carers is a significant issue we raise. Um, and whilst... Uh, uh, um, sorry, uh, the foster carers will not be identified, will they? No, they're not in the material, but they've been served with an adverse notice. So, oh, no. yes. The foster carers? Yes, yes, yes. Oh. Children's uh, Health and, and the Department of Child Safety. Oh, so I, you can imagine this is of some anxiety to the foster parents. I can, and I, I have to say I did not know that they had been served with such a notice. Uh, do you happen to know whether the foster parents have uh, sought or obtained legal advice? Um, I can tell you this, that um, at this stage we see no conflict in being able to uh, take up any matters which would relate to them. So, um, no, they don't have separate representation. Right. And, of course, this, this statement only came in last week. So No, no, I, I, I understand. Time. I think we should proceed on the basis that, first of all, the identity of the foster parents will be uh, protected. Secondly, it is perfectly clear, unless uh, Mr Crowley uh, wishes to uh, qualify or contradict what I'm saying, that no findings whatsoever will be sought in relation to the foster carers and that uh, nothing will appear in any uh, documentation from the Commission in a report of these proceedings that uh, can be understood as adverse to the foster carers. Now, I'll ask Mr Crowley whether he's content or wishes to say anything against that, but uh, 
uh, for myself, um, I would accept uh, that in the circumstances that have been outlined, uh, we do not. I would not want the foster carers to uh, consider themselves at risk of uh, anything adverse being said against them as the result of the evidence being adduced. Thank you. Mr Crowley, are you content? I'm sorry, have you finished, Ms McMillan? I have indeed. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, Mr Crowley, are you content with what I've outlined? Yes, that's I am, and that is the position, Chair. And um, with respect to the notices, um, the, the short point that uh, I wanted to make is that the notices are sent out as part of the process of procedural fairness to alert parties potentially about the prospect that evidence may be adverse, not about yeah. findings, and it's not, a, it's not an assumption that there would be any particular finding that would be made adverse to that party. No, I, I understand that. I think uh, that uh, uh, we need to be a little bit careful about uh, sending notices to individuals such as foster carers who may not, uh, unlike uh, a Queensland or Commonwealth Department, obviously, who would be, which would be extremely well informed about legal rights and entitlements, uh, individuals in that position can uh, get uh, something of a uh, shock when they receive a notice of that kind. So that, that's something that uh, we may need to bear in mind for the future. Uh, but just by way of analogy, I remember a long time ago delivering a judgment in uh, a class action or representative proceedings <coughs> in which it was proposed that notices, legal notices, would be sent out to uh, numbers of people uh, who were um, mature, shall I say, aged. Uh, and uh, in the judgment, I express concern about the impact that notices uh, that are received by people who have no legal training don't necessarily understand the significance of the notices that we generally need to be very careful about how we uh, approach those matters. But uh, having said all of that, I don't think we need to take it uh, any further today. No, thank you, Chair. Uh, that being so, Chair, then we can proceed with the evidence of Ivy, uh, as I said, Chair, the evidence will be led by Ms Tarago and Ivy will be giving her evidence in person here in the Brisbane hearing room. So we'll just need to make those arrangements. Thank you. And I understand that the affirmation will be administered to Ivy uh, through uh, a, 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 an associate at the uh, hearing room. Yes. Thank you. Yes, Ms Tarago. Thank you, Chair. If I could just have a moment for the witness to come into the room. Chair, I believe we're ready. Um, yes. I will read you the information. At the end, please say yes or I do. Do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence which you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Ivy, um, and you understand why I'm calling you Ivy. Uh, thank you very much for coming to our Brisbane hearing room to give evidence today. I'd just like to explain where everyone is because it's a moderately complex arrangement. Uh, you have in the same hearing room with you Commissioner Mason. Uh, Commissioner Galbally is joining the hearing, participating in the hearing from Melbourne. If she rapidly disappears, that's because the earthquake that occurred about an hour ago <laughs> has recurred. <laughs> so we hope there are no more earthquakes in Melbourne no. during the course of the day. 
I am in Sydney. We are so far earthquake free, but of course one never knows. And uh, Ms. Drago is in the Brisbane hearing room and I will now ask her to ask you some uh, questions. Ivy, if at any time you need to take a short break, just let Ms. Drago know and we'll arrange for that to be done. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, Chair, there's just a few um, preliminary things, if I could draw uh, the Commissioner's attention to the statement which appears in Tender Bundle Part A at tab 361. There's also 116 additional documents uh, to Ivy's statement which can be located in Tender Bundle Part A tabs 362 to 476 and at tab 578. I tender the, um, I'll tender the statement in, in a moment, um, but I just wanted to draw the Commissioner's attention to the material. Um, so, Ivy, um, before we start, you've, you've made a statement to the Royal Commission. Yes. And uh, that's a 15-page statement that was dated the 13th of September 2021. Yes. And are the contents of that statement true and correct to the best of your knowledge and belief? Yes, they are. Chair, I tender the statement and ask that it be marked Exhibit 16.17. Yes, the IV statement will be admitted into evidence and given that marking, and I do that on the basis of the uh, interchanges that have occurred this morning between uh, Mr Crowley and myself and uh, Ms McMillan and myself. Thank you, Chair. I also tender the material into evidence. It's at 116 additional documents and ask that it, they be marked exhibits 16.17.1 to 16.17.116. Yes, the, uh, the nexus or attachments to uh, the statement of... Uh, Ivy will be admitted into evidence and giving them, given the markings that uh, Ms. Durago has referred to, and they will be admitted on the same basis as Ivy's statement. Thank you, Chair. In tendering these materials, I draw attention to the pseudonym direction, which is uh, CTH DNP 00099. That is in place in relation to the identities of certain witnesses, including Megan and Ivy. Yes, thank you. Um, now, Ivy, you're a First Nations woman? Yes. And more specifically, a Palawa woman from Tasmania? That's oh, right. And you're a mother of three children? Yes. And your youngest child, Megan, um, has what you refer to in your statement as an umbrella diagnosis of cerebral palsy? Yes. <clears throat> and um, Megan's currently in the care of the Chief Executive? Yes. Uh, and your two eldest children are currently residing with your mother in Tasmania. That's right. And uh, they reside with her as part of a kinship care arrangement. Yes. Uh, Ivy, could you please share with the commissioners a little bit about Megan and who she is as a person? Um, yes. Oh, well, Megan is just turned six and... Um, She's a funny, little, like, outgoing little girl and makes everybody smile. <laughs> yeah. and, and when was the last time that you were able to see Megan? Um, about July. Uh, July this year? Yes. Um, so just to get an understanding of, of Megan as well, um, in 2015 you moved from Tasmania to Queensland? Yes. And at the time you were pregnant with Megan? That's right. And you moved to the Gold Coast area uh, with your two children, um, Megan's older two siblings, and your then partner? Yes. And Megan was born in, in May 2015? Yes, at the Gold Coast Hospital. Um, and when she was about four months old, um, there was an incident where her dad had attempted suicide? That's right. And as a result, he suffered a, an acquired brain injury. Yes. And Megan's dad currently resides in Tasmania and is cared for by his mother as a result of his disability. Yes. 
now I'd like to talk about Megan and her um, diagnosis of her disability. Um, you were first alerted to an issue by Megan's daycare um, staff. Yes. Could you tell the commissioners a little bit about that? Sure. Uh, yeah, well, um, her foot turning in a little bit uh, and the daycare worker su suggested to me that uh, it could be why, why I in her walking and suggested that I um, got some medical advice about, about it. And you took Megan to the doctor? Yes. And you received a referral? Yes, for the child development team. Um, and could you tell the commissioners about um, your road and journey to getting a diagnosis for Megan? Uh, well, uh, we were referred to the child development team at, um, at Lady Salento Hospital and um, that involved a few maybe six appointments and um, where they um, did different tests and um, stuff like that. Um, and around about the fifth appointment, um, one of the lead doctors uh, called us aside because um, it was taking like a long time to do all the tests. And um, she called us aside to um, give us the umbrella diagnosis because um, so that we'd be able to get some um, funding for treatment in the um, prior to getting di diagnosed because without the diagnosis, we were unable to um, get any like therapy and stuff. So um, they gave us a piece of paper that just had um, a list of um, diagnosis and ticked cerebral palsy and explained that this was just an um, a umbrella diagnosis until they were able to come up with the correct um, diagnosis just to enable us to start getting some therapy going in the meantime. Because and was um, that umbrella diagnosis, as you refer to, yes. <clears throat> because there were multiple symptoms that couldn't be um, solely attributed to one diagnosis? Uh, yes, I believe so. And uh, what supports did you receive once you got the diagnosis for Megan? I uh, were able to access the Better Start funding. And uh, so we started um, going to conductive education, um, I believe um, the wheelchair and um, some seating. And did you also seek some support from the Cerebral Palsy League? Yes, yeah, so, and the Cerebral Palsy League for uh, physio, OT, occupational therapy, and speech therapy also. Uh, now I'd like to ask you some questions about Megan's removal. Mm -hmm. uh, Megan was removed from your care in around June 2019? Yes, I believe so. And, and it was just after her fourth birthday? Yes. And her removal occurred very shortly after you had um, organised her first NDIS plan? Yes. And um, when did her first NDIS plan come in place? Do you remember? Um, sorry, I'm not exactly sure of the uh, exact date. That's okay. Um, could you tell the commissioners the process that you had to go through in order to get an NDIS plan for Megan? Uh, we worked with the Benevolence Society to um, set up the plan and um, uh, a few home visits from um, the Benevolence Society where we talked about needs and uh, what therapies I wanted to um, do there. And um, uh, I, I know you, you can't remember exactly when it happened, um, but is it possible that it was in early 2019 and that uh, the NDIS package that was approved was around $25,000? Uh, yeah, that will be about correct. And um, did you apply for um, an increase in her funding? Yeah, I did. Um, the, the, first, the first package that we got uh, didn't allow us to continue at conductive education and we didn't think there would be enough therapy. Um, I also wanted to do hydrotherapy and uh, there was a few a few other things that um so we appealed it to get further funding. And do you remember how much uh, the appeal increased or decreased the package? 
Um, I can't exactly remember. I think it was like, I think it went up to over a hundred thousand because uh, we were getting um, some help with feeding three hours a day and um, the hydrotherapy uh, extra chair was quite a lot increased. <laughs> Um, and, and in your statement during this process where you had been applying and, and appealing the NDIS process, um, particularly paragraph 49, you talk about your experience where Megan was being weighed and a, a nurse had told you that she was underweight. Yes. Can you share with the commissioners that uh, particular occasion? Uh, yes, yes, it was just before our fourth birthday. We were at um, the Queensland Children's Hospital and um, one of it before, so I think this was a part of the um, child development kind of investigation and um, a nurse come and um, took her from her pram and I noticed that she kind of looked down her nose at, at um, me after weighing her and um, that's when I kind of asked her, like, is everything okay? And she said that she was well underweight and that was the first I'd been told about weight. I had asked before because... Um, like I always thought she was, my other kids were quite chubby <laughs> and she she was like my skinniest and I had mentioned it to doctors before but I'd never had, um, like she'd had blood tests and stuff and they'd never come back with any um, news like that. So at that point in time you weren't aware that whether the medical team thought that she was malnourished or anything? No, I wasn't. Uh, and in, in 2019, um, in June, uh, again, whilst the NDIS appeal was ongoing, mm -hmm. um, Megan was in hospital to have a, a peg tube inserted? Yes. And um, did you receive any training around the peg tube in, and how it's to be used? Uh, yes. Yes. I did. And um, do you remember on how many occasions that might have been? Uh, um, I believe we had to do like 48 hours or something like that to take her home, I think it was. Okay. And did your partner at the time also do the training? Yes. Um, and do you recall if there were ever any questions around... Um, attending the training from the medical team? Uh, yes, there was. Um, I think because uh, my our partner signed off first, he got, because um, I was home with the other two children, so um, I hadn't, yeah. Uh, I think he completed it the 48 hours first and um, then they said that I had to actually do it. So, um, yeah, it was um, taking a bit longer. Um, and uh, in your statement, you talk about an occasion of Megan pulling the, the peg tube out. Mm -hmm. Could you share with the commissioners what happened? Sure. Uh, we were having an appointment with child safety at my house and we were sitting out on the balcony and um, laying in the bed in the bedroom and she wasn't um, getting our attention because we were talking to the um, child safety lady, Belinda, and um, she, pull, she pulled the tube out. And um, this was, like, getting on to about 6 o'clock at night. And um, then she was quite um, upset afterwards, so I decided to do dinner. And um, then because uh, we were just working on the oral feeds, like, at the same time, like, um, washing up her food and making sure she was having five good oral meals as well as the nasal feeds. Um, so after I'd... Um, uh, like the child safety officer left and then I did dinner and then <laughs> Megan was getting um, tired so I decided to um, get her ready for bed um, rather than instead of dragging the three children up to the hospital because um, I knew that she'd had the five good uh, oral meals. Um, I thought it would be better to have the tube reinstalled the next day rather than taking three kids out in the night. And um, what happened the, the following day? Um, sorry. So uh, I believe um, 
Megan was got her due to go to school the next day and um, I'd been speaking to um, the nurse at the school. So I was under the impression that um, she would be able to reinstall the tube. Um, so I decided to get her off to school that day rather than her missing more school because she'd been in hospital prior to that. And um, so I decided to take her to school without the tube in, thinking the nurse would reinstall it, but she wasn't able to. So then we had to wait till after school to take her to the hospital to have it installed. And in your statement you talk about it's your feeling that this particular moment was one of the reasons why Megan was removed. Yeah, I believe I read in child safety's paperwork that it had been 48 hours with the tube out. It hadn't been that long. But yeah. um, now, at the time, there were also a few concerns that the department had around um, your drug use at the time and domestic violence. Mm. Um, but only Megan was removed at, at that point in time. Is that yeah, right? that's right. And your two older children had remained with you um, at that two, stage? Yes. And it's only been since 2020 that they've been in the kidship placement? Yes. Um, now, you were aware that Megan was in hospital for a period of time when she was removed? Yes. Um, do you recall how long she was in hospital for? Uh, around about two months, I think. Um, and in your statement, you, you say that you weren't aware that that was because the department were looking for a suitable carer. No, I wasn't aware. At the time, we were doing, um, like, visits every three days up at the hospital and I thought they were just using that time to supervise me. And uh, in late... 2019, um, a suitable carer was found for Megan. Yes. Um, and you say that they're, they're kind people. Yes. And uh, around that time, the NDIS package had been increased. Yes. Um, and in your statement, you say it was around 130,000. Yes. Um, were you able to um, participate in any of that NDIS package with Megan at the time? No. Um, did you want to be part of that process? Yeah, I really wanted to be a part of it. In and fact, that's oh, sorry. No, that's um why uh, one of the reasons why um with the three hours per day super um help with the feeding, I thought that would could be used in my home to um help with them with supervision, like so they knew that she was being fed properly in the home. That's why I asked for it. Um, and when Megan was in your care, um, did you ever have um, anyone really supporting you for her disability needs? Um, conductive education, um, Annette, she was quite supportive. But, um, yeah, she just made suggestions and stuff. Um, now, uh, do you recall whether you were given an opportunity for a kinship placement for Megan? No, we weren't. And at the time, did you experience any questions about your Aboriginality? Um, <clears throat> uh, they did ask us and um, then they apparently asked my mum if it was true. <laughs> and, and when you say they asked us, what do you recall? Um, just if we were actually Aboriginal. <laughs> and are you aware if there are any questions cultural plans that are currently in place for Megan since um, she's been in the care of the department? Um, I'm not really aware of it, but I did ask for her to come to um, the NADOC celebrations and she wasn't able to due to COVID. And also I've asked for her to come to church and she hasn't been able to. Um, now, as, as part of the... Um, the time that there was some intervention by the department, were you required to attend programs? Um, not in particular. Um, do you remember if you attended a Triple P program? Uh, yeah, I've done the Triple P, um, eight units of the Triple P online. And uh, what about the Circle of Security program? 
Um, I I did I suggested to that I would do that, um, but uh, Kumar stopped working with me. So. And um, were you participating in any family led decision making process? Yes. Can you tell the commissioners a little bit about that? Uh, I believe we've had um, three or four family led decision um, meetings, and. Um, Usually, um, I, I suggest all the things that we're going to do and um, I just, um, I look, then afterwards nothing really happens um, and I feel like it took a long time for the meetings to occur and um, I feel like it probably would have been better just for child safety to draw up the case plan that needed to happen. Now, Ivy, I'd like to ask some more questions about um, the NDIS mm -hmm. um, and the package. Uh, was it now that Megan has been in out of home care, um, you've not been able to participate in her NDIS package? No, I haven't. Um, but you since learnt that um, she has, in documentation, been listed as palliative. Yes. And what do you understand that to mean? Uh, I dis I've um, I googled it. It says that it's a disability that she's not going to get better. And how do you feel about learning that? Um, I was really upset because <laughs> I wanted to um, do more rehabilitation with her, and I just feel like that she um, palliative is just keeping her comfortable. Whereas um, I really wanted to like work, like get her to work more and um so recently you've, you've been released from custody yes and you've been proactively seeking some supports to get your life back on track yes what kind of supports have you been engaging um i spent uh two months in Rugby, uh, rehab and uh, i'm now doing the amend program um which is through anglicare um assisting mothers to end the need for drugs. It's um, parent enhancement and, um, uh, like, drug um, relapse prevention. Um, yeah. And um, what, what do you hope for Megan's future? Um, I would really like her to be back uh, with the family and um, to do more rehabilitation uh, rather than um, just being made comfortable to sit there. I feel like that um, like she could do more communication with more speech therapy and with extra physio. She could um, like try to get more active. And... Um would you like to make any recommendations to the Royal Commission? Um, yes, I would like um, there to be for, like more communication with, uh, between child safety and the parents because um, I, I feel like I knew a, a lot about <laughs> needs, which was just really ignored and she was kind of just dumped to the foster carers as um, a little girl that, couldn't walk or talk and they didn't really know a lot and we could have really helped. And, um, yeah. Um, and in, in your statement you talk about uh, a recommendation that parents be involved in health decisions. Yeah, I think that's really important. Would you like to share any particular thoughts that you have with the commissioners? Um. Like, for example, with the NDIS plan, I was really shut out of that and so a lot of funding went to um, waste. So I would have liked to have been able to help um, plan plan out how to spend it, spend it better to make sure she got the most out of it. Um, and also I was unable to go to the hospital appointments, so that really um, makes it difficult for it to be able to plan for the NDIS as well as know what's going on. Well, thank you, Ivy. They're all the questions that I had, um, Chair.
Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Tarago, and thank you, uh, Ivy, for your evidence. I'll just ask uh, the, uh, my colleagues, the other commissioners, if they have any questions to ask you. I'll ask first Commissioner Gelbley, who is in Melbourne. Um, thank you very much for your evidence, Ivy. No questions. Thank you. Thank you. And Commissioner Mason, who, as you know, is in the Brisbane hearing room with you. Um, thank you, Ivy, for your evidence today. Um, I just had a question around um, cerebral palsy association here in Queensland. Have you met other parents who have older children with cerebral palsy um, or other First Nations children with cerebral palsy um, as a way of seeing uh, what Megan's future uh, could look like? Um, yes, at the very beginning when we went to cerebral CPL, um, I did get, I met one um, other parent uh, with a daughter around the same age as Megan. And, um, yeah, she had um, older children as well, so it was a good way to, um, yeah, see that um, how she was coping. It was pretty much the same. Yeah. Do you think uh, for First Nations people being given access to these organisations in your home state um, is important that they, they are part of the team? Yeah, I think, you would, and, I think um, for your family. I think that would be uh, really helpful, yes. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Ivy, thank you very much uh, for coming to the Royal Commission to give uh, evidence. We appreciate your doing so and uh, we wish you well for the future. Thank Thanks, you very Ivy. much. Thank, thank you. you. Can I just say I didn't have any questions for the witness? Uh, sorry? I didn't have questions for the witness. No, no, I assumed that you didn't. Mm. Sorry, you, 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 is that the position? Yes, that's the position. Yes, Chair. Yeah, no, I assumed that was the case on the basis of our previous discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Ms. Tarago, where, do we have a break now? And if so, for how long? Yes, Chair. Uh, if it could be till the 11.15 as scheduled... Uh, so it's, it's currently 10.47 Brisbane time, um, but I would appreciate some time to um, have a break until 11.15. Okay. All right. We'll resume at uh, 11.15 Australian Eastern Standard Time. Thank you. The Royal Commission is adjourned. All right. The Royal Commission is now in session. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr Crowley. I should say it's one thing for an earthquake to happen in Melbourne, but I understand that the shocks were heard in Sydney. That makes it quite serious. We'll now yes. carry on in any event. <clears throat> thank you, Chair. Um, commissioners, we'll now be moving to uh, the next uh, focus point of this week's hearing, uh, which is on secure care settings for uh, First Nations children in out-of-home care. Uh, commissioners, we'll now next be hearing from a panel of speakers from the Aboriginal Legal Service of Western Australia. Uh, those on the panel will be Mr Peter Collins, Ms Alice Barter and Ms Sasha Greenhoff. Uh, the panel will be discussing their observations and from their experience, um, in the Western Australian jurisdiction, the secure care framework and their experiences from working with First Nations children who've been placed in other secure care centres, in particular the Cath French Secure Care Centre in Western Australia. Uh, commissioners, there are four relevant statements here. Uh, firstly, there is the statement of Mr Peter Collins, the Director of Legal Services of the Aboriginal Legal Service Western Australia. Uh, that is to be found in the Tender Bundle Part C, Tab 1. And I tender that statement, Chair, and ask it to be marked as Exhibit 16.18. Yes, the statement of Mr Collins will be admitted into evidence and given the marking of Exhibit 16.1.8. And there are four documents additional to that statement which are in the Tender Bundle Part C at Tabs 101 to 104, I tender those as well, Chair, and ask they be marked 16.18.1 to 16.18.4. Uh, 
The exhibits to Mr Collins' affidavit uh, will also be admitted into evidence and given the markings indicated by Mr Crowley. Secondly, we have then the statement of uh, Ms Alice Barter, who's the managing lawyer of the Civil and Human Rights Unit of the Aboriginal Legal Service of Western Australia. Um, Ms Barter's statement is within the tender bundle part C at tab two. And I tender that statement and ask that it be marked <coughs> as exhibit 16.19, Chair. Yes, the uh, statement of Ms Barter will be admitted into evidence and uh, will be exhibit 16.1.9. And there are two documents produced with Ms Barter's statement, uh, also in tender bundle part C at tabs three and four. I tender those and ask they be marked 16.19.1 and 16.19.2, please. Yes, the two additional documents uh, Mr Crowley has referred to will be admitted into evidence and given the markings he has indicated. Now, the third uh, member of our panel, Ms Sasha Greenoff, has, is the Diversion Officer of the Australian, uh, the Aboriginal Legal Service Western Australia. Her statement is within the Tender Bundle Part C at Tab 7. Uh, I tender that statement and ask be marked Exhibit 16.21. Yes, Ms Greenoff's statement uh, will be admitted into evidence and marked as Exhibit 16.2.1. And finally, there is a further statement which has been prepared by uh, Ms Georgia Herford, the Care and Protection Lawyer of the Civil and Human Rights Unit of the Aboriginal Legal Service of Western Australia. That is within the Tender Bundle Part C at Tab 5. I tender that statement as well, Chair, and ask it be marked 16.2.0. 16.2.0? Just 16.20. Thank you, Chair. 0.20. All right, OK. Uh, that uh, statement will be also admitted into evidence and given that marking. Thank you. There is also a document produced with that statement, uh, which is in the tender bundle part C at tab 6, and if that might be also marked as an exhibit as 16.20.1, please, Chair. Yes, that can be done, thank you, and that will be given the exhibit uh, number of 16.21, yes. Chair, there are some other materials that are, will in due course tender in respect of the secure care uh, evidence that we will hear, but I'll deal with those in an appropriate time. Um, if we could now perhaps move to the evidence of our panel, uh, each of whom are present and waiting on the screen. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr Collins, Ms Barter and Ms Greenhoff for coming to the Royal Commission to give uh, evidence. I understand uh, that each of you wishes to take an oath. In, I would ask you then, please, to follow the instructions of my associate who will administer the oath to you. Thank you. I will read you all the oath. At the end, please say yes or I do. Do you swear by Almighty God that the evidence which you shall give will be the truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Yes, I do. Thank you very much. Now, uh, Mr Crowley will ask you some questions. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you all for uh, attending today. Um, could we please just perhaps go through with each of you and just introduce yourselves and uh, tell us, if you could, please, what your, your positions are within the Aboriginal Legal Service of Western Australia and what your role involves. Um, could I start, please, perhaps with you, Mr Collins? My name's Peter Collins. I'm the Director of Legal Services at the Aboriginal Legal Service of Western Australia, ALSWA, as we like to call ourselves. I've been in that role since 2005, and I'm responsible for the professional supervision of all the lawyers and Aboriginal court officers working in Ellsworth's legal practice. Well, Ms Barter, if you could please um, do the same and tell us about yourself and your position. My name's Alice Barter. I'm a managing lawyer of the Civil Law and Human Rights Unit here at the Aboriginal Legal Service of WA. We're based in the Perth Head Office, but we do outreach across the whole state. We assist clients with police complaints um, all the way up to civil litigation in relation to police. We do a lot of work in around prisoner rights. 
We assist clients with coronial investigations and inquests, and we also help people with racial discrimination. And we represent a lot of kids who are in the care of the Department of Communities and who um, are in a mesh in the criminal justice system and who are experiencing difficulties at Bankshire Hill Detention Centre. Yes, thank you. Now, Ms Greenoff, if you could please do likewise and, and introduce yourself and tell us about uh, who you are and what your role is. Yes, before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land upon which the ALS office stands, the Wajak Noongar people. I would like to acknowledge and pay my respects to the continuing culture and contribution that our First Nations people make of the life of this region. My name is Sasha Greenoff and I'm a proud Jaru woman from the Kimberley region of Western Australia, also a proud Jawan woman from the Catherine region of the Northern Territory. My role at the Aboriginal Legal Service is a diversion officer for the Perth metropolitan region. I'm also the supervising diversion officer for the youth engagement program in the Kimberley region. I'm also the adult bail support service team leader for the Perth metropolitan region and also the Kimberley region. I started work at the ALS in 2017. Um, my first role was the diversion officer, um, but with both roles in the bow support and the youth engagement program, um, we provide culturally appropriate support uh, to our clients. Yes, thank you for that acknowledgement and um, introduction. Can I ask, um, please, perhaps starting with you, Mr. Collins, um, this, this particular part of the public hearing uh, is examining the secure care setting for children in out-of-home care, and in particular within Western Australia, the Cath French facility. Um, in your role as the, um, the managing the Director of the Legal Services. Can you tell us, please, what your uh, involvement and um, experience has been with the secure care facility in Western Australia? Uh, on a personal level, um, I haven't been to um, Cath French, which is the only secure care facility in Western Australia. And although I practice in criminal law, including appearing for children charged with criminal offences in children's courts, I haven't acted for a child who's been held in secure care at Cath French. So the evidence that I'd give today would be based on the learnings that I've gleaned from other lawyers and Aboriginal court officers working at the ALS. And I'd seek to also speak to some of the more systemic issues in relation to this issue and child protection more generally in Western Australia. Yes, thank you, Mr Collins. And in your role then as the director and for what you've just said, um, I take it that in your position, uh, your one of your concerns is with respect to um, policy and legislation and how the operation of that type of facility um, might work in practice and how your service and the lawyers acting in your service um, represent clients who come into contact with that facility. That's correct. Just to put it into some sort of context, and, and I'd ask the commissioners to forgive me because it, it, it's very difficult in order to try and provide a proper context to the situation in Western Australia for us to exclusively confine our evidence today to secure care because so much of the system is overlapping and interconnected, especially in relation to criminal law and the child protection jurisdiction. But it's important, I think, to note that ALSWA provides a care and protection legal service to Aboriginal families and ch children across the state. Our head office, as you know, is in Perth, but we have 11 regional offices across the state and we try to provide care and protect, protection services across all of Western Australia using four lawyers only. So we've got four lawyers employed at ours, well, all based in our Perth head office who are trying to service all of Western Australia 
a geographical area greater than the size of Western Europe. So that perhaps gives some sense of the, of the dimension of the issues that we face trying to provide those services to the Aboriginal community in West Australia. Can I just interpose that, uh, well, I suppose the first point is we don't have a lot of forgiveness to give, but I don't really think you need <laughs> forgiveness. What we're interested in is the, uh, the terms of reference of the Royal Commission, which deal with violence, abuse, neglect and exploitation of people with disability. So translated into this context, that means that what we're interested in is violence, neglect, abuse, exploitation against First Nations children and particularly those who are in out-of-home care. If at some stage in your evidence you would like to link what your observations, whether they relate to the secure care facility or not, to those terms of reference on the basis of your experience from a policy point of view, uh, I'm sure my colleagues would welcome it, as would I. Thank you, Mr Chair. Now, uh, thank you, Chair. And Mr Collins, can I just follow then from your, your last um, answer about the context? In your statement, um, you have at paragraph 25 um, spoken about what you've described as the, lot, the lived experiences of children in care being depressingly predictable. And you've given a, an overview, in effect, of um, what, from your experience and your services experience, might trace a general course of, of a life experience for a young person um, in the out-of-home care system, and particularly where uh, that young person has a disability. Could you just please um, perhaps just take us through that and and identify for us what those relevant stages are that you encounter? In my experience, it starts first with the education of these children um, by late primary school level. Um, these children are starting to disengage from school, either because they're truanting or because they've been suspended or expelled from school. They're almost certain to be at that stage, so I'm talking nine or ten years old, to be totally illiterate and enumerate. A lot of these children stop going to school by the age of 10 or 11. They then spend the time that they should be at school in the company of Aboriginal peers in similar circumstances. They then start abusing alcohol and drugs, often starts with drinking alcohol and using cannabis. In the modern era, that very quickly progresses into the use of methamphetamine. They then start offending so we're talking here about children between the ages of 11 and 13. The offending is primarily for the purposes of funding their alcohol and drug addiction, and these children will be committing dishonesty offences such as burglaries, stealings, stealing of motor vehicles. That, again, almost inevitably quickly escalates into really serious offending, often physical violence, sexual violence, and often under the influence of alcohol and more recently, methamphetamine. By the ages of 15 and 16, these children would have spent quite lengthy periods of time on remand in WA's Juvenile Detention Centre, Banksy Hill Detention Centre in Perth, and then they transition into serving sentences of detention. A significant number of these children are in the care of the Department of Child Protection and Family Services. Many of them have disabilities, in particular FASD and other cognitive impairments, some diagnosed, some not. And then after spending multiple periods of time in 
Banksy Hill Detention Centre, either on remand or serving sentences. These children then translate into adult offenders who spend very significant periods of their adult lives in jail. The way I describe it is they're lost in <coughs> incarceration. Now, I can give the commissioners an example of this, and I think it's important to give real-life examples of what I'm talking about. I, I've been acting for an Aboriginal man from the Nunajara lands, central desert region to the east of Kalgoorlie for around about 15 years. Both his parents were petrol sniffers. His mother was sniffing petrol when she was pregnant with him, and that was documented in various medical and other reports. His mother passed away a couple of years ago uh, as a consequence of a solvent abuse. The client was born without his left kidney, probably due to his mother's petrol sniffing. The client first sniffed petrol at the age of three. He was given petrol by his father. He failed to thrive. His height and weight remained below the third percentile from birth. He was also subject to gross neglect. Following his mother's death, he <coughs> his father continued to sniff petrol and was utterly unable to look after the client. The father spent his time in and out of jail as well. The child was, the client was shunted between various relatives during his early childhood across remote Aboriginal, Aboriginal communities in the Nunanjara lands. None of them, despite their best intentions, had the capacity to properly care for this client. All the while, the then Department of Community Development, the now Community, Department of Community Protection and Family Services, knew what was going on and sat on their hands. He was under their watch before the age of 12 months, and as I say, they did nothing. They had concerns raised with them that the client may have, may have been the victim of neglect or in danger and was suffering from respiratory problems from the effect of sniffing petrol fumes. At the age of 10, police were con contact, contacted the department to advise them that they'd seen the client vomiting blood and the notes recorded by department officers say the following that the client had extensive medical problems, he has one kidney, is a substance abuser, petrol, paint and smoke cigarettes, he is underweight and very small for his age, he does not have a stable home life or reliable carers, therefore he does not receive regular or nourishing meals. Despite all that, they did nothing. Two months later, he was taken back to the department by police after the police found him sniffing petrol. In 2003, a, de a department officer said the following about the client. He has a history of substance abuse. He has medical problems and his ADHD. He has welfare issues and he is without adult supervision or a carer in the community. The client was 12 at the time of those observations. The department did nothing. It took until when the, the client was 15 years of age before he was formally placed in the care of the department. By that stage, it was too late. The die had been cast. This client was offending relentlessly, committing burglaries, and ended up in juvenile detention, which is when I first started acting for him. He, since then, he has cycled in and out of juvenile detention and adult jail, up until 2018, when I appeared for him in relation to a charge of grievous bodily harm, where he'd hit his aunt over the head with an iron bar in a fit of rage after no one would kick the football to him in a football game, and he went to adult jail. 
The material at his sentencing plea was to the effect that no one wanted him. No one wanted him. The non-Aboriginal community didn't want him for obvious reasons. His traditional Aboriginal communities did not want him because he hadn't been through law business and he was considered a child in Aboriginal law. No one liked him in the jail because he was a complete nuisance, jumping on beds, using other prisoners, laundry power, laundry powder, powder, and on it went. So this, this client's in no, man land, no man's land. He's an example of how the system fails Aboriginal people and he's not alone. Thank you, Mr Collins. Um, Ms Barter, can I turn to you now and just um, perhaps ask you if you could tell us what your particular involvement and experience is in respect of the secure care facility in Western Australia and your role in that? Yes, in my role, we assist um, teenage clients with complaints against the Department of Communities and complaints against the police and complaints against Mandatory Hill Detention Centre. A lot of our clients have got complaints against all three of those um, government um, bodies. Um, we've represented children for other reasons who've then um, found themselves in Cath French and assisted them. I was also counsel at an inquest into the death of a young woman who's, who we call Child RM, um, and that inquest investigated the use of Cath French and some of the failings of the department in that case. Um, Child RM was 17 when she died. And can I ask Ms Barter, have you been to the facility, Cath French, and have you um, seen clients there during the time that they've been staying in that facility? My colleagues have seen clients directly at the centre. I did a tour of the centre as part of that inquest with the coroner. We were shown the rooms and were introduced to the staff. Um, my perception of the facility was that it was not purpose built. We were told that it was built for a different purpose. I can't remember exactly what it was, but I think it may have been an adult mental health assessment facility. It's a very cold place. It's very... Um, Stark. There's not many soft furnishings or things like that. The TVs are behind Perspex. The staff, I think, try and make it more of a homely environment, but it is very, um, very cold and, and it really reminds me and my colleagues of a detention centre. It's surrounded by a fence and so the children cannot leave, despite it being in quite beautiful bushland in the Perth hinterland. The um, kids who are there don't get to go out into the um, bush environment. They have to stay within the confines. And I think there's a basketball court and maybe a ping pong table, but not a lot of other recreational activities available to the children. Now, can do, you I have any, do you have any information available or is there information available on how many children are in that facility at any given time? I think... I think it's up to six. And do you have any information or is there any information over a period of time of the proportion who are First Nations children? Yes, I understand it's about 50% chair. Do we have any information on the proportion who are First Nations children with disability? Not to my hand, but anecdotally, I would say that the majority of the children who are in the Cath French Centre would suffer from a disability, particularly in relation to complex developmental trauma and intergenerational trauma. Yes, thank you. Uh, Ms Barter, can you help us then please to, to understand uh, what, the, what the criteria or the basis is for uh, a young person to be uh, admitted into the Cath French Centre? Yes, there are two different pathways depending on whether the child is a protected child, which is a child who is a subject of a protection order, either time limited or an until 18 order, or whether the child is a provisionally protected child, so who's in provisionally, provisional protection and care. In both cases, a child can only go to the Cath French Centre if there is an immediate and substantial risk of the child causing significant harm to the child or another person, and 
there is no other suitable way to manage that risk and to ensure that the child receives the care the child needs. That's under the Children and Community Services Act 2004 WA. The pathways are if the child is in the care of the department with an order, the CEO makes that decision and there's no external oversight. The child can seek a review of that order and can seek a further review to the State Administrative Tribunal, but we're not aware of that happening very often. If the child is in provisional care, then the department must get an order from a magistrate and that can be done before the child goes into the centre or can be done within two days of the child going to the centre. Now, in, in either of those different pathways, um, can you tell us, is the Aboriginal Legal Service uh, or other lawyers that might be able to act, is there a notification system or um, notice given that there is going to be that type of application made or that decision may be made? No, 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 no notification to lawyers. And as far as we're aware, no legal assistance is, prov is provided to any child who would like to review that decision or to their families. I think my colleague, Miss Greniff, has some experience in being told about a child going to Cath French in advance of the time. Yes, um, Miss Greniff, can you please tell us about, about that example? Yes, yeah, so I had a young client, aged 16 years old, um, who was reminded um, at the Bankshire Hill Detention Centre. Um, I was visiting my client that day and I called her caseworker to let her know that I, I was going out to visit her um, and she and asked on what bail options the department had for this young child. The department then advised me that they'd be admitting her into the secure care facility and asked me not to let her know that was going to happen when I went out to Bankshire to visit her. Um, I advised to the caseworker that I wasn't comfortable with telling, not telling my client, as with all my clients, I have a trusting relationship with them. Um, I advised the caseworker that I'd call her back. Um, so I entered the conversation and then I went to speak to the managing family law um, solicitor at ALS who then had written an email to the department to advise that they needed to notify the young girl of their decision for admitting her into the Cat French Centre. Within the within that afternoon before going up to the Bankshire Hill Detention Centre to see my client, uh, the department had let her know that she was going to be admitted into the secure care facility. Uh, so when going to visit my client, my client was scared. Um, she was crying and she said to me she didn't want to go there. Thank you. Now, you've spoken already, Ms Barty, you've mentioned uh, in response to the chair's question about um, what you understand are the, the proportions of uh, children in the Cath French facility who are First Nations children with disability, and you've given some examples of the type of disability. Uh, what I'm interested to know from, from each of you, if you're able to contribute, um, what your experience has been and what your view is about um, First Nations children with disability in the Cath French facility, um, how that may impact upon those children, and in particular in terms of our focus here, which is on violence, abuse, neglect and exploitation of people with disability. Um, perhaps if you could comment on that. Um, just before you do, can I just clarify, I might have um, not been clear in my other answer, yes. that ALS doesn't get any notification for a child who's already in the care of the department. For the child who's in provisional care where there's going to be a court hearing and a magistrate makes the order, the ALS and the family do get notification. Yes, thank you. I, I understood that. I was just wondering whether there were any external sources of information about uh, the children who are in that secure care facilities. They, as we've heard repeatedly in uh, other hearings of the Royal Commission, some involving First Nations people, some not, the starting point is always data. We, we need information. 
um, and I'm not in any way critical of, of your because you haven't had uh, experience because you're not allowed into the place or you're not notified. But it is a it, it is something that we ought to have one way or another. Perhaps the onus is on us to make sure that we get that information. When we have that information, we're then in a position to judge how best to uh, acquire information and assess it uh, in the light of the terms of reference. Now, if I could just go back to um, each of you, the, the question that I raised uh, before was about your your views and your experiences, if you can share with us uh, about what impacts there are on First Nations children with disability going into that secure care setting, the CAF French facility. Mr Crowley, if I could start first with, uh, with a, a quick brief point. Yes. One of the big concerns for Alzwa is that the children who go into Cass French can quickly be criminalised. So you may have a situation where a child is the subject of a protection order, an executive decision is to place them into Cass French. So in other words, the catalyst for their detention in Cass French might not be the commission of a criminal offence. However, once in Cath French, if they behave poorly, often the police are called almost as a first resort. So if a child in Cath French smashes the television screen or <coughs> pushes a worker, the police are frequently call called and the child will be charged with offences such as criminal damage and assault, and they land in court. The point about that is that can happen in any home with any teenager, parents confronting challenging behaviours, but as we all know, it's comparatively rare if a teenager breaks the TV remote or pushes their mother, that the police are called, first of all, and secondly, the criminal charges are preferred. But our lawyers practising in criminal law in the children's court come across this on a very regular basis. And then children are subject to the usual sentencing dispositions and it can be a trigger for further offending and further immersing in the criminal justice system. Can I uh, clarify something to make sure I understand it? The two pathways that have been described whereby children might find themselves in secure care both involve some kind of protection order being made before a decision by the CEO is made to put them into secure care, is that right? Yes. So by definition, as it were, or statutory definition, a child has to be in the care of the department one way or another before they get into secure care. That's my understanding, Mr Chief. And does that mean that, in theory at least, immediately prior to being put into the secure facility, the child will be an out-of-home care of one kind or another? That's highly likely, yes. Well, if the child is in the care and protection of the CEO or the department, they would have to be, would they not, in some form of out-of-home care? Yes. So the link between out-of-home care and the secure facility, which is I'm trying to understand is that you start off with a child who's in the care of the department in out-of-home care or should be in out-of-home care, and that's the gateway to getting into this secure facility. That's correct. So if we're talking about a child with disability, abuse and neglect can come in at a number of points in the life history that you've just traced through the example you gave. It can be the abuse and neglect the child may have suffered in, in their home environment, regrettably, 
Then there's the question of what happens to them when they're in out-of-home care, which may or may not involve further abuse or neglect. That will depend on the circumstances. And what you're saying is that a child that goes into the secure facility is the subject of abuse or neglect because of the nature of the facility and the criminalisation of the child that takes place in that facility. Is that a fair way of describing how you see it? It is. All right, thank you. Thank you, Chair. And Mr Collins, in your statement, you also make reference to concerns about uh, the secure care facility and environment being punitive in nature as opposed to therapeutic. Just explain what concern you and uh, your lawyers have about that. Well, it has all the hallmarks of a jail. You can't get out. Um, and the other, other really important issue for us at Ellswa is the children from all over the state can end up in Cass French. So you may have a, a child from the Aboriginal community of Columbaroo, which is at the very northeast tip of Western Australia, a long, long way, hundreds if not a 1,000 kilometres from the nearest regional town, which will be Kununurra, who's then effectively shipped all that way down to Cass French, a traumatic exercise in and of itself, who then lands in Cass French and who will have no prospect whatsoever of any personal visits from family because it's just simply a bridge too far for them to get from the community to Perth, who may have intermittent contact by video link or telephone uh, with community and family at home. So there's that double traumatisation, I suppose, which children from remote Western Australian Aboriginal communities face by dint of being in the austere environment of a jail-like facility in the form of Cass French. Uh, Ms Greenoff, I'm interested if you could um, perhaps tell us from your perspective and your experience uh, what sort of impact, um, if any, that type of removal from community and country might have for a First Nations child with disability going into the secure care facility at Cat French. Yeah, so I, um, another one of my clients who's 13 years of age, um, she... She was 13 years of age at the time of her admission into secure care. She, was under the, she is under the care of the Department of Communities and she's got to order until she's 18 years old. It is my understanding that the department made the decision for her to be admitted into the Cath French Centre because of her criminal activity had escalated as they felt she was at risk of harm as her court matters were in regards to driving a car. I had emailed the case manager before my client's admission into the Cath French Centre with my concerns of her being removed from a community in Kununurra where she was removed and she was placed into a safe place house here in Perth. Um, and and I, my concerns were that her criminal activity had escalated in Perth, since being in Perth, being removed from her community in Kununurra. She expressed to me on very many occasions that she wanted to go home and this is why her behaviour was the way that it was. Um, so the department made an admission for her to go into the Cath French Centre and her experience in the Cath French Centre, which she explained to me, was it was scary and not a, an appropriate place for children. She felt alone. There were concrete walls and a concrete bed with just a mattress and a TV locked to the wall. There are incidents, there was an incident where she smashed the TV because she was left in her room with no furniture for two hours and she felt scared and alone. The client advised the experience at, at the centre was negative. There were no Aboriginal workers there. The facility was not built for children, she said, she expresses. She, but she did get to make calls back to her family in Kununurra. 
She also said that her little brother attended the centre before her and she said he's not the same today. He's more quiet after leaving there. The client has, my client has also said after that she received no further help from the department after being released back into the community. Yes, thank you, Ms. Greenoff. And Ms. Barter, can I ask you, um, in, in terms of the rationale for the facility as we understand um, its purpose, and you've described it in your, your statement as being a, a circuit breaker, um, that a child in care satisfies the criteria, will be placed in the centre um, for a particular time period. Can you just explain about those and what um, the, the circuit breaker rationale, as you understand it, is designed to do? Yes, from my understanding, a lot of our clients are in residential group homes um, before they go to Cath French, and often due to their complex trauma profiles, as well as physical and mental health needs, they can become dysregulated, so they can become upset and end up, um, you know, smashing things or getting involvement from the police, or they can have self-harm episodes. And so the department then will remove them to the Cath French Centre. From our point of view, though, the Cath French Centre seems to be something that's too little too late and that it's not an effective circuit breaker because the children are released after either 21 or 42 days with very little follow-up. And the statistics from the Child RM inquest show that over 50% of children have a further admission to the Cath French Centre. Child RM had four admissions in there. So the idea is an intensive therapeutic support, but from our perspective, that therapeutic support needs to be brought in a lot earlier. In fact, it needs to be go back even further to family support and keeping these kids with their families in the first place. A lot of our clients will abscond from the residential group home because they don't feel safe there and they're not happy there and they will um, go back to their family members. The department calls this self-selected placements and in occasions, I mean, in relation to one of the case studies in my statement, the department will ask the police to then take the child from the family back to the residential group home and it can be those circumstances that then lead to a child ending up in the Cath French Centre. Now, you've just spoken about, amongst other things, the, the time frames. Uh, there is a 21-day initial time period or time frame if a child in care is admitted into the Cath French facility but that could be extended out to another 21 days to make 42 um, if, if that's thought appropriate. It says we understand it? That's right. It's the, under the Act, it's a maximum period of 21 days. In our experience, most children are um, in there for 21 days from the beginning, um, and the extension is in relation to exceptional circumstances. But we've seen it in relation to children who need further support, and also we've seen too many times that the department have got nowhere else to put these kids. We're told over and over again that they've got limited group homes, they've got limited um, placements for kids with complex needs, and so they, they're in the, literally in the too hard basket. Now, in your view and experience, is the 21-day time frame, or in the exceptional case, the 42 days, for a, a, a child with complex disability needs entering into the facility, is that an adequate or sufficient time to enable therapeutic um, benefit and therapeutic treatment for a child? I don't think it is long enough in one sense, and the coroner and child RM made a recommendation about looking at the timeframes. On the other hand, I'd be very reluctant to advocate for any longer timeframes because of the concerns that we've raised and the fact that we do think that there's huge concerns with the Cath French Centre, I'd be very reluctant to advocate for a longer time period. What I'd advocate for would be um, front-end support, so if, um, earlier on, earlier prevention, and also a step-down approach where children can be in a therapeutic supported environment that doesn't have 
the involuntary nature of Cath French Centre. I'll, I'll come back to you about the step down transition, but I'm just interested, first of all, to um, ask Mr Collins and Ms Greenoff if, if you um, could tell us about, from your views, uh, what you might see as being um, a better investment or a better focus rather than extending a time frame for um, a stay at Cath French, what might be better done in terms of interventions and supports at the front end, types of things that could be done? Well, I think the, the first off should be intensive support for the family, whether that be the grandma, the auntie, the mum. There needs to be a wraparound support for the family. You know, the, our, our, these families are crying out for help with children, and I know with one of the grandmas that I, that I spoke to in regards to the 13-year-old girl that I work with, she said, I've been trying to ask the department for help. If they just give me help, I can look after her. Now, in, in terms of the, for a child with complex disability needs, um, are you able to give us some examples or indications of the types of uh, help or support that in that type of scenario um, might be um, things that would assist the family and assist the child to deal with those needs? Well, I know with the youth engagement program that I work with, I, I have over probably six children that we have helped through the whole process of the NDIS. So through the court process, there, there's an order of a neuropsych report done, then once we get leave from the court to obtain a copy of that report, we take that into our own hands to then follow the process of NDIS. We link them with NDIS, we take the family to the NDIS planning meeting, and then take the family then to, and the young person, to the, to a, the, to the therapist to start engaging to make her feel comfortable. Then from then on, we monitor and mentor through the process until the child is feeling comfortable with the supports that are put in place. We not only put supports in place for the young child, we also put support, intensive supports in place for the family. So we send referrals for the mum to receive intensive support from other service providers. And that's just only myself doing that for a whole family. Yeah. Ms Barter mentioned earlier from the um, inquest into that young girl that there was um, up to 50% of children coming back into the facility. Um, I'm interested to know if you have experience or what your views are about whether after um, a First Nation child with disability enters into Cath French, um, once the 21 days or the 42-day time frame for their stay is finished and they are no longer um, there but placed elsewhere, is there appropriate then support and, and follow-up to ensure that there wouldn't be a repeat return back to the facility? It's, I think it's almost impossible to know, but if the analogous situation is juvenile detention, Aboriginal children with a disability who end up in juvenile detention are almost <coughs> absolute certainties to return. There is no doubt about that. And I think one of the, one of the challenges for... Western Australia, but in particular for the Department of Child Protection and Family Services, is that they've got to start listening to Aboriginal people, to Aboriginal families, to communities, to Aboriginal community-controlled organisations like ours, because history tells us that the department doesn't have the answers. It just doesn't. 
And part of the problem is the department doesn't listen to Aboriginal people. So one of the one of the possible areas of change could be rather than having a, a Perth-based facility to consider having these children, particularly those from regional and remote areas, being placed in the care of Aboriginal elders. But as part of that, you need to capacity build for Aboriginal elders and communities to look after these children because self-evidently their needs and their behaviours are incredibly complex. But in my experience, an Aboriginal child who has the support and assistance from people they know and respect is in a far better place than a child who lands in Cath French. And one of the learnings that I've gained through the, the work that Sasha has done with the Youth Engagement Program, which is a diversion program helping Aboriginal ch children involved in the Children's Court with criminal matters and our bail support service, which helps Aboriginal people, first of all, get bail and then comply with their bail conditions and attend court as required, is the importance of wraparound, holistic, one-on-one -on -one services, which recognises individual differences. I can give you a little example of what of some of the great work that it does. Last week, we had a client, young woman, juvenile, with a young baby. She had been charged with some very serious offences of violence involving um, a close family member. The child wasn't in care but was at serious risk of going into care. A condition of the client's bail was that she have no contact with the alleged victim, the family member, but the child was in the care of the alleged victim. So there was a complex process that needed to be negotiated in order to assist this woman to have her child back in her care because if she didn't, she was at ser serious risk of self-harm. We were gravely <coughs> concerned that she might take her own life. So Sasha got involved and a plan was developed for the client to go with the baby to a regional town in Western Australia. Bail conditions were altered to facilitate that. And then Sasha and another one of our Aboriginal workers drove 400 kilometres at night time to take the client to other family members with the child. And so the crisis is avoided. Now that's an intensive wraparound, culturally secure approach to the situation, which avoided the serious prospect of either an escalation in violence by the client and further criminal charges, or worse, somebody perhaps dying, and the risk of self-harm or suicide on the part of the client. So the importance of Aboriginal-led approaches in this space can't be underestimated. And my strong view is I don't think government get it and I don't think the department gets it. They give lip service to it, but when you get down to the reality of the situation, they don't get it because Aboriginal people in this state are so regularly ignored, sidelined and removed from the picture and therefore the solutions. Ms Barter, can I come back to you now and just ask you um, if you could tell us a bit more about um, the issues as you see it with respect to um, the, the step down and the transition from the secure care setting at Cath French. Um, what happens there and is there something missing in the process? Yes, as Mr Collins said, there needs to be a wraparound holistic service looking at all aspects of the child's life, not just their mental and physical health, but their engagement with education services, their housing, their connection to family and culture. 
And so a step down facility where a child could go after the Cash French Centre could be somewhere where a child can go voluntarily, but with those wraparound support services and then with a plan in place for when they either stay there long term or for when they then um, go back to a family placement or a residential group home. What we see is when kids leave Cath French is that there's a lack of there's a lack of support and there's a lack of um, intervention in the form of mental health services. Um, that is partly because the Department of Communities doesn't assist with that, it's partly because we've got problems with the mental health service generally across our state. Um, but that continual care um, and that sort of intensive nature is what's needed. I'm not sure of what sort of time frame a step down approach would be, but I think the idea would be having a plan so that the child is not just released from the Cath French Centre, sent back to the same environment where they were unsafe, scared, dysregulated, possibly offending, and then the cycle continues rather than actually breaking that cycle, setting up a plan, giving, making sure they have the supports. And like I said, that could be mental health supports, it could be physical health supports. Um, child RM needed a liver transplant at the age of 17 due to chronic alcohol um, abuse. So, um, you know, kids who may not trust going to hospitals um, may want to engage with Aboriginal services, not mainstream services. We've had a lot of, um, we've seen that in the child RM inquest and in other inquests into, in relation to deaths of young Aboriginal girls who have tried to seek help from health facilities and have been turned away and have not had the cultural appropriate support. So it needs to be um, Aboriginal-led for Aboriginal kids and it needs to be designed with the community and have input, preferably 100% Aboriginal staff and a lot of input from elders and from the local community, which is difficult if that facility is in Perth and is catering to children across the whole state. Um, but that's something that needs to be looked into too, keeping kids closer to their country and to their families and their culture. Ms Greenoff, can I ask you about um, that from your perspective and experience, uh, the Cath French facility, is it uh, a place which is culturally appropriate and culturally safe in terms of a secure care setting for First Nations children with disability? No, it's not. Um, why? Why do you say that? I say that because in my observation, I was able to do a tour of the Cath French Centre with one of my work colleagues. Um, when I walked into the centre, it was dark, cold. Uh, there wasn't any Aboriginal workers that I could see there. Um, the children looked alone. Um, the colouring even on the walls, it was very dark. Um, the room setting was similar to that of the Bankshire Hill Detention Centre. And even the, the, the gates and the, the barbed wire they have is reminded me of the Bankshire Hill Detention Centre. There was no natural lighting, only in some areas. And what... Are you aware um, if there are any measures taken or um, services and supports provided to um, promote or to enable um, the connection with culture to, to be maintained for children during their stay there? Where the Catherine Centre is located is... But is, is in the hills of Perth. Now, if you've got a, like my client who was 13 years old from Kununurra, her family weren't able to visit her. She could make phone calls over the phone, but then you, how about the children that go there from the Perth metro region or just outside of Perth? You, you won't be able to get public transport to the facility for the family to go there to visit. And then especially with not having First Nations workers, they're already feeling alone and alienated without having a, a comfortable or understanding person that's in the facility. 
Ms. Barter, can I ask you about um, that? You, in your statement, you've talked about from the inquest you were involved with uh, about uh, an issue about the department employing a cultural therapeutic specialist. Um, and, and at the time, as I understand it, there wasn't a, a, a position for that particular um, staff member or specialist. But that now, now, now may be the case. Um, are you able to tell us what the position is now and, and whether you have any uh, knowledge or experience in its effectiveness? Unfortunately, I'm not actually aware of the current circumstances. I know at the time of the inquest in 2020, the director of the Cath French Centre had put a business case forward to her bosses asking for a cultural therapeutic specialist to be employed at the Cath French Centre and that had been going through the bureaucratic process. The coroner made a recommendation that that should be um, urgently reviewed and urgently someone should be urgently hired for that role. However, there's a response from the minister to the coroner, but we don't get notified of any further implementation, so I'm not actually sure whether that has been, um, whether that has happened. And further, we would say that you would need more First Nations staff at that centre and ideally uh, a high, high percentage of staff members being First Nations um, or at least having someone from a First Nations background there at all times. I'm not sure how much time the cultural specialist was going to spend there, um, but I think that was a, good, it was a good start and hopefully it has been implemented, but unfortunately, sorry, I'm not sure. Now, can I ask you, Mr Collins, um, from... Your, your role and the service um, you are the director of is consultation with um, elsewhere. Is that something that has occurred in, in the implementation, the setup of the centre and the way in which things such as the recommendation for the uh, cultural therapeutic specialist, does that happen? Are your views sought about these matters? No, they're not. Um, Elsewhere, to the best of my knowledge, wasn't consulted in any way at the time of the creation of Cass French and changes that have been proposed that Alice has just mentioned were not involved in the discussion at all, unfortunately. I just want to go to each of you now. Perhaps you have in your statements referred to a number of matters about um, areas where um, change may be recommended. Um, but I just want to go to each of you, perhaps, and if you could just identify and speak to one of those matters um, that you, you feel is an area where the Commission might focus its inquiry in terms of possible recommendations. Um, can I start with you, perhaps, um, Ms. Barter, if you... If you so, just before we get there, um, may I ask uh, whether the members of the panel have are familiar with the report that was done completed in February 2019 the evaluation of the Cath French secure care center done apparently by Quantum Consulting Australia that was an exhibit in the child rm inquest however i haven't reviewed it um, more recently in preparation for this royal commission apologies i see well that's a, on the face of it looks like a rather detailed report that has quite a number of recommendations, 200 odd pages of the report includes a survey of the literature. I was wondering whether the recommendations that are made in that report address the kinds of issues that you've been raising in your evidence today, because that would seem to be a starting point to determine whether the recommendations are good, adequate, excellent, not good and work from there. So I'm just wondering whether that's something that you have given consideration to. Yes, sorry, I'm, I'm not sure whether the review, the 2019 review is separate from Dr. Kelly Thompson's 2018 Churchill Fellow paper called Creation. I, 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 I don't know about the Churchill Fellowship paper, but... What we've got in our documents is this 200-odd page report uh, that uh, I don't know what its status is. I don't know whether it's been made generally available. Um, 
And that's what I'm wondering, because it's a very detailed report with recommendations based upon interviews and all sorts of things. If you haven't, if it hasn't been made available to you, well, it hasn't been made available. That, that's the answer, I suppose. So I, it's got the version that I've got in the papers has that word redacted stamped on each page. So it may be that this hasn't been made publicly available. But what we do, what one can infer, is that uh, in 2019, uh, a rather detailed report was prepared evaluating the Cath French Secure Care Centre, a number of recommendations, and that report, as it happens, does contain a good deal of statistical information about uh, the children who've come into the centre over, at that stage, uh, the seven years of its life from 2011 to 2018. There is a, 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 some statistical information in a statement that's been prepared by um, Ms Calders, and presumably that will be tendered in evidence uh, later, and that gives us some statistical information during the whole of the 10-year life of the, uh, uh, the facility, but uh, the information in that statement is rather limited and does not, uh, is not as detailed as that in the evaluation. So... I'm not sure where we are on this. Um, maybe Mr. Crowley can help, or somebody else can help. Is this is this a document that has been published? Is generally available, or, or what? Yes, Chair. Well, that that document, uh, the report and recommendations, will be matters that will be addressed with Ms. Calders when she gives evidence this afternoon. But is the answer to my question is yes? It's a public document, or no? It's not. I think that's so, but I'll need to check on that, Chair. Yeah, well, at some stage, I hope uh, we might uh, address this by using that report, which may or may not be an excellent report. I don't, I don't know, but it seems that if you've got a recent report, it's only two years old or a bit more, that would be the starting point to determine what needs to be uh, done. Now, I do notice that in the list of uh, another of my favourite words, stakeholders, have been consulted. There doesn't seem to be any Aboriginal organisations that were consulted. That's Appendix C, other than the Durbal Yerrigan Health Service, I assume. Um, but uh, that's something else to be considered. All right. Just if I could respond in, in relation to if it is not a public document, if it was provided to us as part of our preparation for the inquest, there's a direction from the state coroner of Western Australia that we can't use any of those materials for any other purpose other than preparing for the inquest. So if it's not a public document, we don't have access to it. I see. So this review was not, in fact, made public? Not that I'm aware of. I could be wrong. Yeah, all right. Well, we'll, we'll no doubt find out uh, in due course. But uh, it does seem a trifle curious that we <laughs> We should be examining the way this centre works and we haven't got, uh, at least publicly available, the uh, foundation document for the review. All right, um, we'll no Chair, doubt all Chair, be revealed. Chair, might I be able to assist in that regard? Um, my yeah. very learned junior has found a copy of that report on the West Australian Parliamentary website. Oh, well, there we go. Democracy is alive and well in Western Australia, apparently. All right, well, let's continue, Mr Crowley. Thank you very much for your diligent junior's work, uh, Ms Furness. Thank you, Chair. Um, Ms Butter, I was just concluding by asking each of you if you could just, um, if you could identify for us uh, any particular recommendation that you wanted to emphasise from what you have addressed already in your statements or other parts of your evidence. Yes, as I said before, the Cath French Centre and any therapeutic centre can be too little too late. We need to look earlier on and we need to look at family support because kids need to be with their families. We see them going back to their families. Child RM was going back to her mum and living on the streets so that she could be with her mum. So I think that's really important that kids are going to go back to their families anyway, so we need to support families. That support needs to be holistic needs to be Aboriginal-led, needs to be culturally appropriate and trauma-informed, bearing in mind that the parents often have got 
intergenerational trauma and other trauma and complex needs themselves. I think it's not particularly complicated. There are a lot of organisations across WA, grassroots Aboriginal organisations, who are designing their own solutions. And I think that the government and that we non-Aboriginal people need to listen to First Nations voices. First Nations families have got the solutions and we need to make sure that they're funded and they're supported to then support their communities. Yes, thank you. Mr Collins, can I ask you um, if you have anything that you wish to add in terms of those types of recommendations? Instead of making one point, can I make four little ones? First of all, there's no doubt that Aboriginal people want to stop the removal of their kids into state care. They want to stop their kids going into juvenile detention and they want to stop adults going into jail. There's no doubt about that. That's point one. Point two, I'm strongly of the view that WA needs a truth-telling commission. Point three, point three, there is a dire need in Western Australia and I'm completely nonplussed as to why it hasn't happened yet. There is a dire need for legislated for Aboriginal courts in the Western Australian justice system and in this space, an Aboriginal care and protection list. Aboriginal-led, Aboriginal solutions, which has as its primary focus capacity building and empowering Aboriginal families to properly care for their kids so they don't end up in care in the first place. Fourthly, if I can refer to Mr Chair's comments at the start of our evidence in relation to data, I respectfully agree that data is incredibly important. However, it's a vexed issue for an Aboriginal organisation like us. We have all manner of data reporting requirements to our funding bodies, which we have to comply with, and it can be a difficult exercise at times close to impossible in some situations to be able to acquire data in relation to, for example, the numbers of children, Aboriginal children going into care with disabilities and in turn ending up in places like Cath French. The department should have that data and that data should be made available to organisations like ours for use in exercises like this. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yes, I wasn't, I wasn't suggesting, Mr. Collins, that it was your responsibility to collect the data. I was only wanting to know whether the data is available. And I didn't interpret the, your comments that way, either, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, now, Ms. Greenoff, um, could you tell us, is there anything you wish to add in terms of those types of recommendations or any other matters that you've addressed in your evidence? The first matter I'd like to address is about the reports or further therapeutic uh, support after they've uh, been uh, released back into the community. So going back to the 13-year-old young girl that I worked with, after she um, came out of the Cath French after 21 days, there was no further therapeutic support provided to her after she returned to her placement. In a case planning meeting that I attended, it was raised that she needed to receive counselling to address her trauma needs. And I was asked to find culturally appropriate therapeutic support for her and also was asked to speak to her and encourage her to attend those therapeutic supports that I was to find. I was advised by the case manager that they had received a psychological report from the Cath French Centre and in that report it contains detailed details of her trauma. I asked to obtain a copy of that report so I could understand her trauma needs and I was advised I was not permitted to obtain that copy. This is still the case today, six months later, and now she's returned back to the detention centre at Bankshire Hill. That's one thing I'd like to address and reply to that. Um, in, in conclusion, I would just like to say First Nations children are being removed at higher rates in Australia and, not, and are not receiving the culturally appropriate support they require. They are being removed from their families and communities and are being placed in institutions where their spirits are being diminished. I understand how spirits can be diminished as my mother was forcefully removed from her mother at a young age and raised in an environment that diminished every part of her soul. 
I have witnessed the pain and suffering this has caused her. So when I'm dealing with my clients in situations where their souls have been diminished, I see the pain I see in my mother today, in them. So in my view, the Cat French Centre is not a therapeutic place for children to be held. It's not appropriate and, and nor is it culturally appropriate. It does not help with their trauma. If anything, it, it excavates their trauma because these children are feeling more traumatised when whilst they're there. So it is, in one of my recommendations, a culturally appropriate therapeutic centre for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children to address not only their trauma but to address the intergenerational trauma. This should be First Nations design and led. Predominantly First Nations employees where possible traditional healing techniques by the elders and combining other interventions with a decolonising approach as previous therapeutic practices have not been effective with our First Nations children. Yes, thank you, um, Ms Greenoff, for that evidence. Um, Chair, those are the, the questions that I have. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I'll just ask my colleagues whether they have any questions to put uh, to uh, the members of the panel today. Commissioner Mason, do you have any questions to put? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I had a question about the Closing the Gap National Agreement, and you would all be aware of that document um, and its contents generally, and it has uh, in it, in the, in the content of this National, Parla national Agreement, details around four priority areas um, to progress reform in closing the gap. And they cover these four reform areas, formal partnerships and shared decision-making, building the community control sector, transforming government organisations, and also shared access to data and information at a regional level. Um, I had a, my question is, given the complexities that you've shared this morning and we've looked at this one particular area of secure care and, and our interest in First Nations children with disability in the out-of-home care system, uh, what uh, perhaps I might ask um, Mr Collins to answer this question about the trickle-down um, approach which may happen with this Closing the Gap National Agreement in that this particular area of secure care, the, t the time it would take to trickle down this ambition to those children and their families and the change that's required, what, what, what do you see as the, uh, the, the steps that are needed for that to be escalated and to be uh, progress in a much quicker way? from your experience? It, it requires a willingness on the part of government to embrace those messages in the closing the gap philosophy. Because what we've found and I've found during my time at the ALS is there've been countless reports, inquiries, commissions, you name it, into the circumstances of Aboriginal people in Western Australia, and most of those inquiries and reports and so on are gathering dust on shelves. And, and the best example of that is the Royal Commission recommendations into Aboriginal deaths in custody. I dare say if you asked a, a recruit into the police academy today whether they could tell you one of the recommendations from that Royal Commission, they wouldn't be able to. So it's evaporated from view in real terms. So I think government needs to embrace the notion that Aboriginal people are the original inhabitants of this country and they have a rightful place within the community which is currently being denied and that there's an urgent need to take up recommendations aspirational things such as the closing the gap recommendations and then support them practically, which involves money. 
You've got to you've got to build capacity. You've got to listen to Aboriginal communities, Aboriginal community controlled organisations like ours, because as I said a moment ago, government departments don't have the answers, and the numbers of kids in out of home care is in Western Australia is testament to that. They've been an abject failure, and they can tell you all they want about listening and improving things, but we know on the ground nothing has gotten better. Before I gave my evidence today, I looked at the the latest Australian Bureau of Statistics data in relation to Aboriginal imprisonment, and it's the same as it was when I started at the ALS in 1995. It hasn't improved. Now, that's a scandalous situation. And the same applies with children in detention, Aboriginal kids in detention, and I dare say in the care system. So we've made no improvements on that score in 25 years. And this government in Western Australia, the state government has talked about its KPIs in relation to Aboriginal people being improving Aboriginal wellbeing and reducing rates of Aboriginal imprisonment. And guess what? That's fallen off the radar too because of COVID. Now, I get it that COVID's an important thing, but that needs to be front and centre of every single government decision that's made, which impacts upon Aboriginal people, and every single law and policy that's been introduced. How do we improve Aboriginal wellbeing? Because I tell you what, locking kids up in Cass French does nothing for Aboriginal wellbeing. We all know that. Thank you, Mr Collins. I just also wanted to say before I hand back to the Chair that this national agreement is the first time that all states and territories are now parties to the agreement along with peak, uh, all Aboriginal uh, organisations, um, including local government. And so uh, we will watch with interest around the development and also the uh, monitoring of, of targets and uh, achievement of progress uh, because previous to this current agreement, uh, states and territories weren't party to the closing the gap ambition. Um, and of course, uh, as we're finding um, this week, uh, the issues and concerns being faced by First Nations people with disability, particularly children, um, are not confined to one jurisdiction. So. Really appreciate your time today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Mason. Commissioner Galbley, do you have any questions? Um, look, I was very interested in some of the solutions um, proposed um, by Mr Collins and all, all of the panel members, and particularly paragraph 32, um, the therapeutically focused Koori Aboriginal Child Protection List in the magistrates' court in Victoria, and I, I guess it's just um, then we go on to look at the community justice reports, the, and we've heard from um, Ms. Greenoff about the Aboriginal therapeutic wraparound holistic service, which sounds like it's working in some jurisdictions. I just wondered if you'd want to comment on that further, and whether we could get as much information as possible. We can we can go look at that but whether you'd want to comment on it yourselves about the results. Speaking bluntly, Aboriginal courts have been my hobby horse in this jurisdiction for over 10 years. And, and I can't for the life of me understand why governments in Western Australia can't see the merit in them. And because the proof's in the pudding. If you look at what's happened in Victoria, Curry Courts have been in existence for over 15 years now. In magistrate, Magistrates Court in Melbourne and suburban Melbourne and in regional Victoria where, where there are significant numbers of Curry people, it's in existence in the Victorian County Court and it's now been um, created as a, as a protection and care list operating, I think, out of Broadmeadows Magistrates Court. And it's so important that these courts are legislated for, that they're embedded in legislation because it means that they can't be abolished 
at the whim of government. And the problem we've got here is that we have a smattering of courts with that sort of model, but they're all just, they're, they're, their architecture is underpinned by a government decision. So they can be whisked away in a heartbeat and most of them are very poorly resourced. And I think one of the things that appeals to me about the Victorian model is the government has actually devoted resources to these courts so they work. I've seen them in action and they're an incredibly impressive mechanism, if only that Aboriginal people meaningfully engage in the process. And I'm talking here about community elders, community members, and in a criminal context, an Aboriginal accused. So that's completely missing here. West Australian courts are an appalling sausage factory. I've been in courts as an advocate where you might have 120 Aboriginal people in the list and you've got to plough through that court in one day because the magistrate flies back to another court on circuit the following day. That's not justice. That's not justice where I come from. And frankly, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be allowed in any part of Australia by non-Aboriginal people. They get away with it because Aboriginal people traditionally don't complain. They're very stoic and they cop what comes their way. But it shouldn't be the case. Likewise, when it comes to the Aboriginal community justice reports, again, the Victorians have led the way there. Our counterparts in Victoria, the Victorian Aboriginal Legal Service, have, have secured funding to develop these reports. I read in a reported sentence in the Supreme Court yesterday where an Aboriginal man was sentenced in relation to a charge of manslaughter that a community report was before Her Honour, Judge Jane Dixon, and she, she commented how, how important it was for her to have material before her which spoke to some of the intergenerational and systemic issues which had a direct impact on the life experience of the person she was sentencing. Over here, we have pre-sentence reports, which form an important part of the sentencing process for Aboriginal people in the criminal jurisdiction and similar type reports are generated for protection and care proceedings. They fail Aboriginal people. They are unremittingly bleak and negative. Invariably, they're done by an a non-Aboriginal person who's trying their best and all those sort of things, who's never had a, a relationship with the Aboriginal person they're reporting upon. And for, for Aboriginal clients who don't speak English as a first language, interpreters are never used. So these reports are damning. They send people to jail. They land kids in care. And it needs to change. We need to have reports that are generated by Aboriginal people who, have, who understand the nuances, who understand the cultural subtleties, who actually can present a perspective of the Aboriginal person and their community to a court because they're so important. They've done it in Canada with Gladue reports as well. We need it to happen here because things won't change. People will continue, kids will continue to go to care. People will go to juvenile detention. People will go to jail. Nothing will change. Thank you. Thank you. Um, was, was there anything further that you wanted to ask, Commissioner Goldman? No, I, I guess it was um, also the therapeutic wraparound. I was very, you know, that sounds really important. And I was, as well as a centre, well, I was wondering about it being a service that's out in regional and remote Australia too. That's a very good question, if you don't mind, <coughs> Commissioner. If you don't mind just answering it briefly, Mr Collins, because we've, got a, we've got a time problem. I, I will. Um, the Bail Support Service has been established in Broome, run through our Broome ALS office, and the Youth Engagement Program has also been established in Broome, but it's nowhere else in regional WA, and there's a, a strong need for it to be rolled out statewide, Commissioner. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, um, I'll just inquire whether there are any questions to be asked by other representatives, um, starting with uh, Western Australia. Do we have any questions? Chair, for the reasons that I've discussed with Mr Crowley, I won't be asking questions of the witnesses. Yes, thank you very much. Um, and I assume no other party wishes to ask any questions of the panel that has just given evidence. In the absence of anybody leaping up, I'll assume that the answer is they don't. 
In which case, thank you very much for coming to the Royal Commission to give evidence. We appreciate both the written statements that you have provided, the thought that has gone into them, and the oral evidence that you have given today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Now, uh, we now adjourn, I take it. When uh, should we resume giving people enough time to uh, nourish themselves and otherwise refresh themselves? Yes, if we could have 1.45 resumption uh, Eastern Time, Chair. Yes, all right, we'll do that. We'll resume then at 1.45 Australian Eastern Standard Time. Thank you. The Royal Commission is adjourned. The Royal Commission is now resumed. Yes, uh, Mr Crowley. Good afternoon, uh, Chair. Uh, Sorry, Mr Power. That's right. Uh, commissioners, this afternoon we'll hear from Ms Astrid Calders, the Executive Director of Specialised Care and Accommodation with the Department of Communities of Western Australia. Ms Calders will provide evidence in relation to the operation and administration of secure Secure, sorry, the Secure Care Framework in Western Australia within the context of the Cath French Secure Care Centre. Uh, commissioners, you will find a copy of Ms Calder's statement in Tender Bundle Part C, Tab 8. I asked to tender this statement into evidence and asked that it be marked as Exhibit 16.22. Yes, the... Uh statement uh, to which you've just referred can be admitted into evidence and be given the designation Exhibit 6.22. There are also 42 additional documents to this statement. Those materials are at Tender Bundle Part C, tabs 9 to 50. I asked to tender those annexures into evidence and be marked as Exhibits 16.22.1 to 16.22.42. Yes, those additional documents will also be admitted into evidence with the marking of Exhibit 6.22.1 to 6.22.42. Yes. And Chair, uh, Ms Calder appears before the Commission and I ask that she be sworn or affirmed. Uh, Ms Calder, thank you very much for coming to the Royal Commission to give evidence. Uh, I understand that uh, you uh, take, will take an affirmation and I would ask you to follow the instructions of my associate who will administer the affirmation to you. Thank you. I will read you the affirmation. At the end, please say yes or I do. Do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence which you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you, Ms. Calders. Um, now, Mr. Powers will ask you some. Mr. Power will ask you some questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Calder. Could you tell the commission your full name and your occupation? Uh, yes. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you. And can I start with an acknowledgement to the traditional custodians of the land on which um, we meet from and appear from today, the Wajak Nunga Buja uh, people, and pay my respects to elders, past and present. Um, and pay my respects to all Aboriginal people who are listening today and are part of this Royal Commission. Um, my name is Astrid Sophie Louise Thyra Calders, and I'm an Executive Director in the Department of Communities. My Directorate is the Specialised Care and Accommodation Service um, Area, which provides the Department's 24-7 metro-based residential services. Uh, we have a range of uh, facilities for our children in care. We have the Cath French Secure Care Centre. We have a range of services, uh, supported community living services for adults with disability. Uh, we have a small number of services for crisis and emergency for people um, with disability. And we also have the Disability Justice Service, which includes the Bennetbrook Disability Justice Centre um, and a range of allied health services that add into those services. That's part of my responsibility at this time. Um, thank you, Ms. Calders. And uh, is it correct that the statement which has been tendered into evidence um, is a statement by you explaining the legislative um, framework under which uh, sec a secure care arrangement uh, can be made for children uh, and the operation of 
the Cath French Secure Care Facility? It is. Okay. Now, just to establish the, the, the broad framework um, first, um, is it correct that the relevant act is um, Children and Community Services Act 2004, Western Australia? Yes, it is. All right. And um, in your statement, you've abbreviated that as the CCS Act? Yes, it is. All right. Now, um, in terms of um, giving evidence, if you could ensure that you um, keep a relatively um, even pace so the Auslan interpreters can keep up, and for the benefit of all of us, if you use an acronym, as is understandable, if you could perhaps explain the acronym the first time you use it. Um, now, if we can, um, uh, I suppose, begin at the beginning, um, what is a secure care in the context of the Western Australian Act? Uh, the secure care placement is a legislative framework that enables us to place a child in secure care where we have concerns of immediate and substantial risk to a child causing significant harm to themselves or another person. And there are no other ways to manage that risk and to ensure that the child receives the care necessary. This is an option of last resort and is intended within the legislative framework to be for a period of time that in order that enables stabilisation um, and, uh, if you like, uh, regulation of the child in a point of, of developing their own emotional regulation, managing the immediate concerns, um, and that the children who are who come to Cath French are only those children that are in either. Um, a protection order or that there, there is um, an interim protection order. Right. So to, to come back to what you noted at the start, um, you, I think you were paraphrasing just slightly, but it, it, what you said about the two preconditions um, of immediate and substantial risk to the child, uh, causing significant harm to the child or another person, and that there is no other suitable way to manage that risk and ensure that the child receives the care the child needs. Um, that's a legislative requirement before such a placement can be made? Yes, it is. All right. And you mentioned uh, the, the children who are potentially um, for whom uh, such an order can be made. Um, does a child need to be under an existing order before an order under Section 88C of the CCS Act can be made? Yes, they do. All right. Um, now, um, if, if we can uh, go to the routes by uh, the, the pathways by which a child can enter the, that system, and sorry, I'll start again, um, is Cath French uh, Centre the only uh, centre in WA uh, that, is that fulfills that legislative role? Yes, it is. All right. Um, so a shorthand to um, going into that secure care system, um, I'll, I'll probably refer to it as entering the Cath French Centre. Um, what are the pathways by which a child can enter the Cath French Centre? pathway for referral is that the district will become very concerned, so their case manager and the district that the child belongs to will be concerned about a child's presentation and will seek to make a referral to the Cath French management team. That process is often a process of initial consultation. There is a written referral process that accompanies the uh, referral. The Cath French management team and the district will discuss the um, placement and discuss uh, the kind of concerns that they've had and particularly whether they meet the legislative framework. There's also a requirement if the child is Aboriginal that there's consultation with the district Aboriginal practice leader and with, with any specialist that might have been working with the child, some of the psychologists that may have been working with the child um, so that the, by the time the um, referral is finalised and it's negotiated and, and discussed, there may be 
a period of backwards and forwarding around the referral. Uh, the referral is then um, reviewed by Kath French, who then make a recommendation to the delegated executive director who can make that approval. So that is part of one of my responsibilities. Um, and so referrals will come to me, at which point then there'll be further discussion with the Kath French team around the suitability of this referral. Um, and sometimes we agree and sometimes we disagree because we have a, you know, we are, we're very cautious because this needs to be an option of last resort. Um, and of course, risk is not always a perfect science. So we have a debate about how immediate are the concerns. Uh, we also make sure that um, the child meets the age range, which is 12 to 17, unless there are very strong exceptional circumstances. Uh, whether there, there are issues around the child coming off country, there's a lot of discussion around whether this then is the most appropriate option and making sure that uh, this isn't about a placement option. This is really about managing uh, that immediate uh, concern and risk. Now, um, in your statement at paragraphs 11 to 17, you map out this process, but if I can just perhaps um, uh, go through it uh, briefly. So um, the CEO is the person who has the statutory power under the CCS Act to make um, a secure care arrangement, um, but you note that it's been, the CEO has delegated this power to the three uh, executive directors in community services. Now, you're one of those uh, directors, and as you've indicated, you're one of the people who makes the these decisions as a delegate for the CEO. Is that correct? That's correct. And uh, do you make the majority of, of those decisions, or is it shared relatively evenly between the, the three uh, executive directors to whom it's been delegated? I make most of those decisions. I can explain why that's the case, if that helps. Y yes, thank you. Uh, part of our process is that um, one of the executive director is um, responsible for all of the service delivery. So hence his teams are the teams that refer. Uh, the other executive director who um, was here yesterday, uh, Glenn Mace, operates the statewide. He then can act because... Um, between the district and Kath French, is the third executive director is able to operate to review any um, reconsiderations. So a child's able or a family member is able to say, no, they don't want to be in Kath French. And so that leaves the third person to be that um, executive director to able to do that reconsideration. Um, if any of us are on leave, it means uh, any of the other executive directors can step into those roles and we can move them around. Does that make sense? Yes. And we'll come to the review process in a moment. What you're saying is that um, you make the majority of the primary decisions. The other two directors are empowered to make review decisions as needed. Yep. And yes. um, you mentioned that there was a recommended age group of 12 to 17 years unless there were... Um, which is in your statement as extenuating circumstances. Um, is that a legislative requirement or is that a policy uh, decision by the department to have that age range? That's a legislative requirement. Okay. All right. Now, um, in paragraph 13 of your statement, you also refer to the Children's Court of Western Australia um, may make a, an interim order um, can you explain how the court becomes involved in these decisions? So if a child is on an interim um, order, a referral will come to me and I can all I can do is approve whether they are admitted um, in the because of the immediate risk. We admit the child to make sure that that immediate risk is covered. And then within a 48-hour um, period, the application has to be made to the children's court and the court will then confirm whether they agree with that decision. That court will also determine the duration of the placement, noting that it can't be more than 21 days. What's, a, what's an interim order? So that's an order, um, an interim protection order is where there hasn't yet been a time limited or a um, till 18 order put in place. 
So that's an interim protection. Um, often at that point in time, uh, there are still uh, child safety investigations ongoing. Um, and there um, may be a lot of work happening with the families to look to whether they can be uh, reunified or whether there's actually substantive risk um, present. And does it happen that an interim protection order is made contemporaneously with the child being placed uh, in secure care? Uh, the interim order usually precedes um, the, the, the referral. Yes, thank you. So... In terms of uh, understanding this, if uh, a child is on a protection order, um, uh, the CEO or the CEO's delegates can make an order to place a child into Cath the Cath French Centre. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. If a child or a young person is not yet under a, a perm a, any order from the department, there can be a stepped process where one, an application is made to the children's court for an interim order, and then the child can be uh, uh, can be placed in the Cath French Centre, but only by way of a court order. Is that correct? Um, it's not quite correct, Mr. Powers. It's no. um, a child has to be on an interim order for the referral to be made, because if a child's not in any kind of care of the CEO, that's not the purpose of Cath French. So legislatively, the children have to be on a on some form of protection order, either right. interim or time limited. Um, then those children are eligible for consideration if there are concerns. Okay, but it, uh, uh, could it be almost simultaneous? That is, um, an application for an interim order is made because some emergent situation has occurred, and then the department considers that uh, uh, that the circumstances uh, under 88 capital C of the CCS Act are satisfied such that almost immediately um, there's, a, there's a decision made to place the child in the Cath French Centre? It can occur. It's, it's not that common. And um, we're also very clear that the reason for bringing a child into interim care isn't to enable the placement. Right. So we, as part of that referral process where some of those discussions occur, um, but you're right, there may well be um, concerns that would meet the legislative threshold and there's already a process in place that um, a child is going to be placed on an interim order. And then, the, like I say, the referral is made and the child is placed at Cath French and then it goes back to the court. It may be that if those processes happen at the same time, the court could make that decision for a child on an interim order. All right. Now, um, how does secure care in Western Australia differ from uh, residential care? I guess the, the key consideration is to, to look at the legislative framework and also to understand that the Cath French is a secure unit. So when we say secure, it is a locked unit. Our residential care houses, the children uh, come, can leave at any time. They're not locked houses. Um, we have a range of residential care uh, options in WA. Uh, the ones I mentioned that um, I'm responsible for is um, managed by departmental staff. So we, we still have a range of, of facilities where our departmental staff manage children in small groups of, of four. Uh, we have contracted services. We have um, a large amount of community service organisations who run family group homes. We also have a range of other um, out-of-home care um, funded and uh, placements and foster care arrangements and so forth. So there's a continuum of service. But the key distinction between residential care and our Cath French secure care is the fact that it's secure. There are some commonalities that is it worth talking about if you're interested in me explaining some of the therapeutic frameworks that we use across both to, to develop staff? Is that uh, uh, and We might come to that in a moment. But so the critical difference um, is that if you're in the Cath French uh, 
uh, secure care facility, um, you as a child or as a young person, you're not free to leave uh, at, at all. Now, in a residential care facility, um, I take it that there are some restrictions placed on children's ability to leave, say, in the middle of the night. No more than a normal household would, would take, but particularly older children, if they choose to, they can leave um, if they wish to from our residential care houses. All right. How many residential care houses are there in Western Australia? Uh, the department managers, um, I have 15 in the metro. We've got nine in the regions. They're the ones still managed by the department. And I can't um, remember exactly how many, because it varies a little bit um, what's happening with the contracted arrangement. There are many more managed by community service organisations. Um, I can get number for you, but it's... It's in the proximity of around 40, but I wouldn't like to cite that number. All right, well, you, you, you can provide that if you don't mind in due course. Are all of the children in residence at uh, these uh, uh, centres uh, children who are in the care and control of the uh, department? Yes. They're all Why, in the family what, group. What, what determines whether a child is sent to a residential uh, centre as distinct from being placed uh, with uh, a, a, a family? Uh, these are family group homes, so they, they, they aren't centres or hostels in that sense. They are houses where we have four children. The determination is often based on uh, the need. We have, Like I say, we have a continuum of placement options for children uh, where we have children with families, where families are able to manage the children. Where the complexity starts increasing, we often find that families aren't able to uh, cope with children. Uh, often happens in the older age group, our residential, our metro residential uh, children are mostly in that teenage years, that same 12 to 17 um, and sometimes we also have uh, two of those houses are also crisis transitional where we may have a crisis situation that a child family placement or um, a placement with a community service organisation has broken down. So they come into one of our residential group homes. Are there any statistics available on uh, the proportion of children in the residential homes who are Aboriginal? Uh, yes, we can get you that. I haven't got that at my fingertips. No, that, all that's of all right. residential that's all right. homes. And are there, um, is there data available on the proportion numbers who have disability and what categories of disability there might be? We do have stats on uh, whether the children have a disability. This is evidence that was tendered by Michelle um, Andrews for um, hearing number eight. Um, I'm just checking. Um, and there is stats in there. Uh, we use a definition that's in our legislation around what is a disability. Um, and so we don't... That's all right. I'm just wanting to know whether there is data available on uh, the residents of uh, these residential homes, group homes, concerning their disability and what that disability is? If the answer is yes, we'll be able to get hold of the data, I assume. You will. Yeah, all right. Thank you very much. Can I just ask a question of clarification? These group homes aren't the same as um, community residential units used by the disability sector, are they? They're, these are different. Um, so the... the the issue of severity of disability would be a question I'd like to um, get an answer to at some point. And how there's a, if there's a relationship to community residential units, which are disability group homes. They are a distinctively different group. The, children, the group homes I'm discussing here are for our children in care. Um, they aren't the disability group homes that operate um, 
And do children in care go into the disability group homes if they're disabled? Or is that Do you have a relationship with them? They can from time to time, um, but we do have children with a range of, of um, you know, particularly complex trauma presentations um, and psychosocial issues that are in our uh, children in care. Do I take it that it's difficult to find foster carers in Western Australia for children who are in care? Uh, it's an increasing challenge, and I think it's something that we've been looking at. Um, you will have heard from Glenn and Mal yesterday that uh, we have a range of um, agencies who provide some of our out-of-home care and foster services. Uh, we also um, have foster carers that we engage ourselves, um, and I think it's an increasing challenge, yes. Is the department's uh, general preference to have a child uh, for a child who is in care by virtue of an order, either interim or longer term, is the preference to have that child placed with foster carers or is the department neutral or what? Our, our preference is to uh, place the child with family carers. So particularly for our Aboriginal children, we work hard to find uh, family placements for children. Um, and then um, depending on the, uh, the, the child, uh, we also have significant other. Um, so there are people who the child may know who are significant other carers. And then we have um, foster carers who would not be known to a child. So our preference is always to keep the child with people that they know and who are, you know, assessed as being, being safe. But are, you also operate in accordance with the principles for uh, placement of uh, Aboriginal children. We do indeed. Yeah. By the way, just as a matter of interest, I noticed that in Western Australia, the preferred term seems to be Aboriginal, whereas elsewhere it's First Nations. Is there any particular reason for that? That's on advice from our Aboriginal people. Is it? No. Yes. Okay. Um, uh, so uh, uh, we were discussing the uh, the legislative basis by which a child or young person can enter the Cath French uh, Centre. Um, in other jurisdictions, there are similar models, um, but, for example, in New South Wales, secure care orders are made by the Supreme Court um, with the equivalent of your department able to make um, application on an urgent basis. Uh, do you see any uh, disadvantages uh, of a judicial oversight in terms of making secure care orders um, of the type that are made presently on an administrative basis? Uh, our uh, model was based on consultation with other models. So the Victoria model had been in existence, as had the New South Wales model, at the time of establishing uh, they looked at those options, and one of the feedback that we got, particularly from Victoria, was that there are challenges in um, keeping clear the child and protection matters as distinct from other um, matters that may be before the court. Uh, so the preference at the time of setting up the legislation was to keep that focus and enable the department to make that clarity of decision so that the focus is on the, child, the care and protection matters. More recently, we've had some examples uh, where we continue to see that there are benefits to us being very cautious in our approach around the placement of a child in secure care. In discussions with Victoria, for example, and this is anecdotal discussion, they continue to uh, express some of the challenges where some of the children who may be sent by the court, um, the clarity of their need may not be as clear as we're able to retain around the immediacy of that significant um, risk. Uh, we've also had some recent examples where um, courts have sought to make Cath French a bail condition, which we have, of course, opposed because that is a exclusion criteria to have a child that the matters are criminal. Um, and again, sometimes the mental health services wish to discharge a child, but only if they can come to secure care, which we are very clear that we're not in a position to do and a child needs to be able to be discharged to the community. 
So we see that having control of that decision making helps us navigate that space and remain clear about the purpose and intent of the legislation. And remain clear of the courts. The courts are able to review the decision if a child seeks to have consideration. There's a, a, uh, you know, and the interim orders are also seen by the court. By the tribunal, isn't it? The tribunal, yes. So the courts are able to review interim decisions um, and mostly they agree with the decisions that we've made. Okay. Um, uh, Ms. Gould, there was a lot bound up in that, but I wanted to perhaps go to that last issue first, which is the um, review. Now, this is dealt with at uh, paragraphs 41 to 43 of your your statement. Um, And as you've noted, um, it presently is an administrative decision of, of the department which places uh, a child or young person in the Cath French Centre. You note that under the Act, there is an application can be made for the reconsideration of a secure care uh, decision and that that reconsideration is made by a different executive director than the one who made the decision. Now, you then note that if the applicant is aggrieved by the outcome of the reconsideration, he or she may apply to the state administrative tribunal for review of that decision. Now, um, the uh, the maximum period for which a, a child or a young person can be placed in the Cath's French Centre in terms of the, at least the first order is 21 days. Um, Firstly, how long does it take um, for a reconsideration of an initial decision to be made? A uh, reconsideration is usually made within 24 um, hours um, working of a working day. Right. And the reconsideration, does that involve a discussion between the executive uh, directors or is it uh, based on a, a, essentially a, a clean file um, being placed before the the other executive director uh, for a decision. It's the latter. They right. they receive a clean file. They review the referral um, and any comments that the child has raised or the family member or whoever is seeking reconsideration. Yes, and and I should have said you you've noted that the under the act it can be the child, the parent of the child, the child's carer, or any other person the CEO considers has a direct and significant interest. Right. Now, um, West Australia may be more fortunate than other places, but um, it would be the case, wouldn't it, that the State Administrative Tribunal is very unlikely to be able to hear a review of an administrative decision of the department within 21 days. Is that your experience? Uh, they, no, our experience is that they hear them very quickly. It's right. usually a matter of days before when we get a hearing for a reconsideration. Yes. Thing. Yeah. Yes. Um, now, the uh, the Supreme Court in New South Wales um, has um, a parens patriae, uh, a Latin tag p r p a r e n s p a t r i a e jurisdiction. Um, so does so does the Supreme Court of Western Australia and every state court. In Australia, yes, that's and chair. That's what I was about to say. So, the, the by virtue of being um, a, a superior court of record, um, it, New South Western Australian Supreme Court would have that jurisdiction as well. Uh, do you know whether there are any uh, applications made to the Supreme Court in that in that context? My understanding, and I can't comment completely. I'm still relatively new in WA and in this role that there has not been a Pars Patriae application to the Supreme Court um, at this time. Yeah. All right. And uh, in terms of um, the, uh, the review uh, proceedings, um, is there any funding made available um, by the department to any child or parent who wishes to review the decision by going to the uh, WA Administrative Tribunal? Uh, the child receives legal aid 
uh, and is represented by a legal aid lawyer at the hearing. Um, Sorry, the hearing, the hearing of the... the... The tribunal. Okay. And are you aware of where that funding comes from? Is that a, 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 a funding to legal aid that comes out of its general resources or is there a, a source of funding from your department to legal aid for this type of hearing? I understand it comes out of their general um, resources. Uh, I'm unaware of any direct funding that we do to legal aid. Right. If, that, if there were direct funding, um, would you be able to take that on, on notice and, and let us know if there is any direct funding for that? Will do. All right. Um, now, you, you've indicated... Oh, sorry, uh, again, I... We heard earlier that Kath French, uh, uh, sorry, in evidence this morning, that Kath French uh, facility can contain a maximum of six children at any one time. That's correct. Um, do you think that six is enough? Is, is there a need in the state of Western Australia for that number to be greater than six? There are times when we have... Just a been... statement. Sorry. Sorry, carry on. Oh, there are, there are times when we have had six on the whole in the last year when I've been responsible for the centre. There has only been a couple of times when we have been full, but on the whole, we, don't, we aren't full. Um, this week, we've had two children. Tomorrow, that'll go down to one unless we get new referrals. So um, at this point in time, we don't see... Um, a, a demand for extension. Okay. And uh, if you have six in the facility and an urgent case comes in, um, given the, the nature of the criteria, um, is it the case that that new intake would be given priority and essentially the most ready to leave within Cath French would be urgently moved out into a residential care facility? There's two parts to, to your question, yes. then, if I can take it as two parts. Yes, thank One you. is that, um, yes, we would look at the children who are there, how close they were to, um, you know, uh, their dates of, of discharge. Uh, we would also look at the criteria, as we do with all referrals. We make sure that there aren't alternative options for placement. Um, I also want to note that not all children return or, or come from a residential care place or return to a residential care place. Uh, children come from a range of different placements um, in a referral. They can be in a foster placement and they can return to that. They can be in a therapeutic high needs placement. They can be, um, some of our children come from mental health facilities and sometimes because of their presentation have to be discharged back to a mental health service. Um, some of our children come from Bankshire Hill Detention Centre. Right. And in terms of, we, we, I suppose, dealt with the number, the, the numbers in Cath French, uh, and in short, you think that six is sufficient for the state's needs? At this time, noting that we wish to uh, keep uh, uh, very clear around the criteria for admission, and that minimising the time that a child's liberty has been removed while they're in that locked facility. And there are there is initially 21 days, which can be extended for up to 42 days, so two lots of 21. Um, is that time sufficient in your experience? Each child is unique. Um, the children that come to Cath French vary significantly in their presentation. We have quite around about 60% of the children who come to Cath French over the last uh, 10 or so years that the centre has been open come once, which tells us that that's sufficient for, you know, the majority of children. Um, some children come back to us, which tells us that sometimes it's that they needed to um, go back to the community and, and they were stable at a point in time, we find that uh, on the whole, we don't try to go to the maximum time. We go to what's necessary for the child. So it may not be the full 21 days. Some very complex cases, of course, we look at, um, and there's a lot of planning around transition, 
but um, we may look because some children become psychiatrically unwell while they're at the centre. So all of those things can occur. So each child is very much unique. It's very difficult to say whether there's a you know an average um, formula for the children. All right. Can I take you to paragraph 44 of your statement? Um, because you deal there with um, the numbers of uh, children who are in the Cath French Centre uh, over the last uh, 10 years, uh, and that is the full 10 years of its operation um, uh, up until June of this year. Is that correct? That is correct. Right. Um, so, and it's May to June, so we, we, we have one month beyond 10 years. Um, now, the, the totals, which are in the right-hand side, are 78 with a disability and 217 without a disability, which is... 295 uh, children in total. Um, is that um, a number of admissions? That is, uh, that might only be, let's say, 200 children, um, but a proportion of them have entered twice, or is that 295 children who may have, in fact, entered more frequently into Cath French? I understand this to be the admissions. Okay. I'm not you sure you're right. I'm not sure you're right. If you go to paragraph 2.6.2 of the 2019 review, it gives you frequency of admissions, 219 children over seven years, and then it breaks up the numbers that have had more than one admission. Uh, so you've got 131 with one admission, 46 with two, 19 with three. Since there's an average of 30 children each year going in, Seven plus from 10 leaves three, that would give you about 90 in the three years, and that's where you get 295. So I suspect okay. I suspect they're actually individual children, not admission. I stand I may, be, I may be wrong, but uh, that's the way it looks to me. I stand correct, Chair, and I do note that we have said that this is the number of children. Right. And how do you know th which ones have disability and which ones don't? How, how is that determined? Uh, we use the legislative definition. That assessment has usually been made by the time the referral has made. It's made by the um, child protection worker um, based on our criteria that's in our legislation, uh, which is in uh, Section 79 of the Children and Community Services Act. Um, which what, what, what are the sorry? What are the qualifications of the child protection wor worker who's making the assessment, for example, of cognitive impairment, intellectual disability, autism, or whatever? There can be a range of sources. Some of it may be from assessments that have come with the child. Um, a number of our children have NDIS plans, so we have um, information from those. Um, uh, a number of children, of course, are in the process of um, assessment during the time that, by well, the time they are referred. So that would be um, made by, um, you know, a determination of a range of sources of information. And what if those range of sources uh, is not available? Uh, presumably, the case officer wouldn't have uh, the expertise to determine whether a child has got a particular intellectual disability or cognitive impairment. Would, would that person have that ability? On the whole, they wouldn't make that judgment unless there was clear evidence that um, a disability existed. That's the point. If, it, if there isn't clear evidence because there hasn't been a diagnosis, then that would understate the extent of disability, wouldn't it? Potentially. Yep. Okay. Um, on that point, we heard evidence uh, on, on Monday from uh, Dr Webster. Now, Dr Webster is based in the Northern Territory, but paragraph 109 of his statement, and I realise you most likely haven't reviewed it, but um, reads, a recent study at Banksia Hill Detention Centre in Western Australia, the Banksia Hill study, found that 89% of young offenders have a severe neurodevelopmental disorder and 36% were diagnosed with um, fetal alcohol syndrome disorder. This is the highest prevalence of neurodevelopmental impairment in a custodial context to have been found in the world. Now, the, the, the Banksy Hill study that uh, Dr. Webster was referring to is um, footnoted to his statement, but it, it is um, a, a study where the lead author was um, Carol Bauer and 
uh, and it's titled Fetal Alcohol Spectrum Disorder and Youth Justice, a prevalent study among young people sentenced to detention in Western Australia. Now, um, in terms of uh, what's noted at paragraph 44 of your statement and linking back to what um, the chair has asked, um, it's very likely that, that those rates uh, that are of disability are a very significant understatement of the degree of, of the numbers, oh, sorry, of the percentage of children with disability. Would you agree with that? I wouldn't have any evidence to go either way on that. This is the um, information we have around what um, is noted in our case files um, and what is, what is presented for the children that have come in, um, noting that sometimes the, um, the information has both changed over the years and also the criteria that uh, the WA Disability Services Commission um, definition of disability changed under the NDIS definition. So I appreciate that definitions change over time um, and information that the caseworker have. Um, I wouldn't know what 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 percentage of under or over represent well under representation this might be. Okay, so I think in answer to the chair's question, you said that it's an under representation, um, but given uh, okay, um, the the same uh, a very similar group of people are going to be in Banksy Hill Detention Centre as are in uh, the Cath French Centre. Wouldn't that be correct? There is some overlap. Yes. Uh, and, and in fact, people are in the Banksy Hill Detention uh, Centre because they've committed um, or, or are alleged to have committed criminal offences. Um, but they are not necessarily fitting the criteria for being in secure care, which is, if you've noted, an immediate and substantial risk to the child causing significant harm to the child or another person. So that first criteria is that there is an immediate risk of the child causing harm to themselves or others. Yes. Um, that, that, that's correct, isn't it? Yes. With the exclusion that if it's only harm to others and it presents as criminality. It's one of our exclusion criteria. Right. But because of that first criteria, that would uh, indicate that, the, uh, the, that there is something significantly wrong, going wrong in that child's life that's causing them act, to act in that way. Yes. And in the, the, part, the second part of the criteria is that there is no other suitable way to manage that risk and ensure the child receives the care the child needs. Yes, yes. Now, given those criteria, you would expect, wouldn't you, that um, the degree of um, cognitive problems that would be likely to be present in the Cath French Centre population is going to be at least as high as that in the Banksy Hill Detention Centre. Would you agree? There's not a total overlap of populations, but there is indication that that could be... There are some children who move between both um, Cath French and Banksy Hill Detention Centre. And you, if I understand your answer correctly, the, the figures that are in paragraph 44 are essentially drawn from, well, what's recorded on their file with regard to disability at the time they enter the Cath French Centre. Is that correct? That's correct. Um, do you think, given the criteria for entry, that there is, uh, it would be important to have a multidisciplinary assessment of children entering the centre, um, or at least for the opportunity to be, for that to be done, um, unless it's not, uh, uh, unless it's not going to be um, unless there's some potential for uh, harm to the child? I'm not sure I understand your question, Mr Power. Well, uh, premise one is the test that has, uh, that has to be applied before a child can be enter into the Cath French Centre. Yes. Um, given that's the case and given the knowledge of what the study at the Banksy Hill Detention Centre showed, 
do you agree that um, unless it, it, there is a contrary uh, indication that a child should receive a multi multidisciplinary assessment whilst the opportunity exists in the Cath French Centre to, in, to determine whether a disability exists? Um, the completion of a multidisciplinary assessment, um, particularly for neurodevelopmental um, issues or FASD, is a time consuming and it takes a period of time. For a child to be able to be assessed in that manner, and I draw on some of my experience in my previous roles and um, my um, professional qualifications, this a child needs to be stable and able to participate in which can be quite lengthy assessments um, and interviews. So while some of our children may have that already on file, we wouldn't be in a position to do that immediately before or during the referral process because we're dealing with a child who is presenting with um, immediate and substantial risk. So we wouldn't do it at the point of entry. Completing it while at Cath French, for some children we're able to do that because they're stable enough and we can, provide, we can either use our internal unit, we have a neurodevelopmental assessment team that can, if the child is stable, potentially do that um, or we can start that process uh, with external providers. Again, that process for uh, multidisciplinary team assessments is a lengthy process and it requires the child to be in a place where they can participate. Otherwise, their assessment is going to um, show pretty significant underperformance. Okay. Um, uh, sorry to interrupt. Recommendation one of the 2019 review recommended, if not already undertaken, that a comprehensive assessment of children admitted to uh, the secure facility be undertaking comprising screening for particular conditions, e.g. intellectual disability, mm -hmm. depression, anxiety, and a comprehensive biomedical, psycho, I assume psychological, mental state examination and screening for mood, mood disorders and social peer staff interactions assessment and educational functioning needs. Has that been done? We're doing a range of those services. However, a neurodevelopmental assessment is a significantly more complex assessment than screens for um, depression and anxiety, which we have introduced. We have introduced uh, the Welltree um, Wellbeing Framework that assesses a number of those factors, which we're also using as part of our evaluation framework. Um, but completing a multidisciplinary neurodevelopmental assessment is a much more complex um, process and task. Um, and it requires my, my question was whether the recommendation has been implemented. Yes, it has. It says that in the document, and then when you look at the information, it says there was a pilot of the World, World Tree Wellbeing Outcomes Framework to support ongoing assessment as pilot. Then a business case was presented for funding a psychiatrist, but no psychiatrist has been found. How is then the recommendation being implemented? We're using the resources we've got to assess children where we can. Um, our challenge for, to obtain a psychiatrist, we, we have implemented the Welltree Wellbeing Framework as part of a, the regular processes now. Um, we have funding for a psychiatrist. We do have a psychiatrist who um, is able to do uh, telephone consults but we are unable to find a psychiatrist who's prepared to come up to the centre um, on a regular basis in person. So we have worked very actively. Um, we have quite a shortage of child psychiatrists in WA. Uh, we've approached quite a lot of them. Um, and unfortunately, we haven't yet been able to have one who is prepared to come and attend in person. All right. So well, we when a child gets admitted, how, is the, how does the process work? as far as screening for intellectual disability, depression, anxiety, uh, mood disorders, and so on. How, how, who does that? How does it work? Uh, we have a range of, um, we have a health uh, team who do assess the child on, on admission. Uh, we use a lot of observational um, measures. We have a senior psychologist on site um, who provides consults. Again, we use a screening process rather than um, full assessment, 
but we aren't always able to complete all of those assessments. It depends on the child's presentation um, and we, we track some of those um, behavioural indicators uh, that help us provide some of that assessment. How have things changed since before 2019? Um, we have sought to have uh, greater, um, the, we were very hopeful to get a psychiatrist, so um, unfortunately we haven't been able to do that. So while we continue to have our consultation, um, we do have our, our health team there um, on three days a week where we can make sure that the children are assessed or bring them in as necessary. Um, we continue to look at um, using our Welltree wellbeing model, which enables us to screen for a range of those issues um, on intake, and we also do that on um, placement. So it's an ongoing um, piece of work to improve how we provide assessment. We're also talking to um, other um, providers that we enable access um, at when at all possible. Um, because a number of the children come with NDIS um, plans, so we make sure that their providers can um, access and, and come on site. Do you think it's a bit of a stretch to say that recommendation one has been completed? Which We've is got... what which is what uh, the actions completed document said. We've, we've implemented the screening. They, they aren't full assessments. They are screening assessments, Chair. Um, so if uh, there isn't the capability um, to conduct the full multidisciplinary assessment, is it not the case that given the criteria for entry that that child or young person should be flagged, the department's file should be flagged to say, once the child is, is in a good position to benefit fully from such an assessment, it should occur because they've reached such a crisis point that they've been put in the Cath French Centre. Do, do you agree that that's something that should be the default position? It depends on the presentation and the needs of the individual child. Not well, also... Sorry, can I just stop you there? You remember the test that's put the child into this uh, uh, situation. It's a, as you've said, it's a, a measure of last resort. So don't you think the default position should be that the department says this is a child in our care, we need to ensure that the multidisciplinary assessment is conducted. Do, do you agree with that? I tend to see it as a much more individualised process, that some children, when they present at serious self-harm, that their needs are met within, you know, we work closely with our mental health service to seek that they've got psychiatric um, assessment. Um, they don't all present with the need for full um, multidisciplinary assessments. Um, and sometimes you can overassess children um, unnecessarily, but um, looking to provide, you know, assessment is, is, is always beneficial, but it's assessing every child um, in a multidisciplinary way may not be necessary. It is also you know, at times a challenge to access some of the multidisciplinary assessments, depending on what the needs and presentation of a child is. All right. Well, to return back to paragraph 44 of your statement where the numbers are, are set out. Now, I think we've established it's, it's 295 individual children. Um, how many presentations were there? That is, how many um, child days in total are there, and you may not have that to hand, but would you be able to provide um, that? That is, how many times each of those 295 children went to Cath French? Um, and, it, and whether, if it, I imagine it's possible, the number of total child days, which would provide an average of time spent by, any, by a child in the Cath French Centre. We can, we can, I can take you roughly through the repeat presentations, but I'll have to get on notice the number of days that, that um, a child had been on. Had been okay. On okay, so it would be beneficial to have that, but also whether children who did have a disability marked on their file were more likely to be returned to the Cath French Centre because what we have now is uh, the 295 child 
295 children who entered the Cass French Centre. But we don't know, and we have the percentage marked with a disability or without a disability, but we don't know uh, how frequently or how long each of those groups stayed on average and how much more likely one or other group were to be required to re-attend. Um, would, your, would your statistics be able to break that down? We shall try and provide you that statistics. I can tell you about some of our children, a group of children who um, returned on many occasions. Yes. Uh, we had a small look at, at um, the 11 children who were the most frequent return children. Um, and uh, the profile of those children tended to be um, a greater number of female children. They were um, less likely to be Aboriginal, um, were a slightly older group than, than on average, so they're more likely to be in the 15, given that that probably also accounts for the, their repeat presentations. Um, and we had a look at, again, it's a very small number um, at their NDIS reports, whether they were had an NDIS plan, um, and that was actually less than the overall um, pop the overall percentage of people of children with disability. All right. Um, so if you were able to provide the, what, what uh, data you can and breakdown that you can, that would be appreciated. Um, we're now at 2.45, Chair. There was a, a break planned um, for uh, 15 minutes at this point uh, before uh, um, Ms Calder's uh, returns for the second uh, hour of her evidence. Is, is it a convenient time to, to take a break, Chair? Oh, sorry, Chair. I, I think you're on mute. I was just checking whether... Am I? Uh, uh, yes, yeah, sorry. I shouldn't be. Am I, am I still on mute or by No, unmute? thank you, Chair. Uh, so I was just asking whether uh, yes, the timetable has a, a, a break for 15 minutes. Uh, it, is it a convenient time to take a break until perhaps 3 pm? Yes, certainly. Uh, we'll do that and resume at 3 pm. Thank you. The Royal Commission is adjourned. The Royal Commission is now resumed. Uh, just before we continue, um, as you remember on Monday, um, I said that uh, this is the week of the International Week of the Deaf and Australia's National Week of Deaf People. The theme uh, for today, I'm informed, is sign language for all deaf learners. It is appropriate to mention that since we have the services of magnificent uh, interpreters who operate under conditions of extreme stress <laughs> and rapidity constantly and do a fabulous job. So thank you to our interpreters and uh, let us acknowledge the theme of today, sign language for all deaf learners. Yes, Mr. Power. Um, Ms. Calder, the Cath French Centre is meant to be a therapeutic place, that's correct? We provide therapeutic care services, we do, yes, Mr. Power. And when a child or young person arrives at the Cath French Centre, what information do you have about uh, any disability they may have? The staff have access to all of the uh, file for uh, child protection. Um, there's quite a significant amount of information already in the referral, but they can access all of the, the same information that the child protection worker may have. All right. And so uh, is that file electronic or is that file a paper file? Uh, electronic. Okay. And uh, what... I is there a procedure that's followed uh, to on intake into the Cath French Centre to determine whether the person has a disability? That assessment comes already with the child. This is an assessment made prior to the child arriving. Uh, and so that, that is if it's recorded on the department's file? Yes. All right. 
Um, you would acknowledge, wouldn't you, that children may have disabilities that are not recorded on the department's file? Yes. Now, because of the high threshold of entering into the CAS French system or the CAS French uh, secure care facility, um, what steps are taken to determine at that point whether the child has an unrecognised or un, uh, undiagnosed or at least uh, a disability that's not recorded on the department's file? The immediate concerns when a child arrives at Kath French is keeping the child safe and stabilising the child. There, can, the information we obtain while a child is in the centre through a close observation, uh, the work of the staff there, the health centre staff, as well as um, observations um, recorded and discussed at the management team, uh, may well indicate that there is information that needs to be sought and further assessments needs to be um, needs to occur. And through some of our screening tools, that may also be highlighted. But in the initial days, it's really stabilising a child and making sure that they're safe, uh, dealing with the immediate risk that um, brought them to Cath French around um, often their self-harm or their, um, you know, their, their current presentation of behaviour. All right. But if the stay at the Cath French Centre is to be therapeutic, surely you have to know what the problem is. Uh, can I just explain the, the language of therapeutic that uh, we use to describe the centre, which is around the therapeutic care services. Um, our children in Cath French aren't in, don't receive like uh, therapy sessions as an individual therapy with um, specialists. They don't all receive that. Some of them may, but the model is around therapeutic care services. So this is, our staff in um, Cath French are trained in the sanctuary model, which creates a therapeutic milieu or therapeutic community in which the children operate, as well as our therapeutic crisis intervention. So our staff are trained to work very closely to understand the child, understand uh, what might be driving those behaviours, and to be able to develop a relationship um, and an interaction that enables them to learn their, uh, how to regulate their emotions, how to understand some of their emotional states, understand some of their, at times, um, explosive behaviours. So that therapeutic care isn't necessarily, we don't run therapy, group therapy or a lot of individual counselling services. From time to time, they are brought in. But it isn't. Um, it doesn't provide like you might think about uh, a, a rehab center or um, a, a center, for example, if you are treating eating disorders. It doesn't provide that kind of therapy. It is around therapeutic care services. Does that mean that it's not part of the therapeutic milieu to correctly diagnose whatever conditions the child may be? experiencing, nor is it part of the therapeutic milieu to treat that underlying condition. Rather, the therapeutic milieu means attempting behaviour modification. It attempts developing the child's uh, understanding. It's not around behaviour modification. It's, un it's, it's getting alongside the child, helping them co-regulate, understand those um, immediate emotions. Where we identify further assessment is required, then that is flagged and we may, if the child is stable and able to participate in further assessments, we may bring that into the centre um, and, or make a recommendation with the case manager that that needs to occur um, following their placement at the centre. Is the process you've just described accurately described itself as therapeutic? Is that a correct use of the term, do you think? The, the term that occurs in um, out-of-home care and um, in the literature around our sanctuary model is described as a therapeutic care service, um, and that is um, used throughout um, the residential care um, services that we provide, 
Um, and is, that's how the models are described um, by the universities from which we have um, received these models and work with these models of service delivery to children. We do have, like I say, um, the presence of you know, psychologists um, and a, a Kath French, our senior psychologist, to guide what the staff do. So it's, it's helping the staff understand um, and understand what might be happening for the child. Have you, has any university been involved in the processes that are employed in, at uh, the uh, centre? Uh, the therapeutic crisis intervention is a model that we are registered from through Cornell University, um, and we retrain our staff in that on a regular two yearly basis. Um, the sanctuary model again is. Sorry, is but that model. Cornell has published something, has it that uh, yes. you adopted? Yeah. Yes. That's in Ithaca, New York. Rather depressed when last time I was there. Yes, all right. Um, Mr. Powell. Thank you. Um, so just to understand, um, if somebody presents in a way that leads to a concern that they may have a cognitive disability or may have... Um, uh, a hearing uh, loss. Uh, what does what happens in the Cath French Centre? If that was new information, yes, um, we would then seek to talk to the case manager, um, noting that the case manager has the primary responsibility for the child, even when they're at Cath French, um, and um, we would seek to have uh, the child referred for an assessment whether that can occur in the time frame of the 21 days and whether the child is, as I indicated before, stable enough to undertake an assessment. Um, the nursing staff may do a screen, but if we had concerns that there was, for example, a hearing loss, we would certainly seek to have um, uh, an assessment completed um, with, in uh, line with the case manager. And do your files reflect what percentage of children or young people entering the Cath French Centre, that is the 295 over the last 10 years, what percentage of them were noted to be in need of some form of assessment during their stay in the Cath French Centre? Do you have any percentage? No, I'm sorry, I don't. That would be in case notes and potentially reflected in, in the uh, discharge plan that's written um, that would go with the child. So I don't have any information on, on um, new assessments identified while at Cath French. All right. And is it something that could be obtained from the data? Uh, that might be very tricky. We can look, but I suspect that it's not identified in a way because it would be embedded in the case notes rather than in um, something that's a searchable um, item because it's, like I say, some assessments might be in progress, some assessments would be newly identified. Um, we, we can certainly look to see if we have that information, All right. but I doubt that we do. Okay, in so if you could form. determine whether you do or you don't, but do you think it would be valuable to have um, a standalone part of the file which reflects their time at Cath French um, so that there can be some sort of validation about whether this intervention that is, involuntary confinement, has resulted in benefits to an individual child? Do you, do you think that would be important? Uh, I do, and that is part of the implementation of our um, evaluation framework and our well-being, our well-tree well-being um, assessment, which has a number of domains that, that checks anxiety and depression um, and checks, um, you know, the child at the beginning, at the end of the placement. So... Uh, the 295 children that we have had through the centre till the, uh, June this year, they are on a separate, um, we, we are tracking those children, but we don't have um, good data on all of those children, hence our um, implementation of improved data so we can do exactly that because we do need to understand how effective it is and for which children it's, it's more effective than maybe for other presentations. All right. And so if I understand that correctly, in more recent times, uh, y y you are um, doing that process of identifying what interventions occurred at the Cath French Centre um, 
and you're going to track those children into the future. Is that correct? Yes, we are. Right. Um, so in answer to the earlier question, uh, it, it, it may be that there isn't data for the full 295, but there may be data for um, more, in more recent times. Yeah, and it's, it's like I say, we're in the process of implementing that framework. We, we have it um, and um, we need to build some better ways to capture some of that data in a way that's more searchable. So that is a work in progress, Mr. Power. All right. Um, now, if I can just return briefly back to timeframes, um, have you had the opportunity to review um, uh, Dr. Kelly Thompson's uh, statement? I have read it, yes. Yes, and one of uh, a, a suggestion that um, she raises is that um, there may be uh, circumstances where um, a longer period in secure care of up to six months, um, albeit she contemplates a purpose-built centre being developed, um, do, do you consider that... Um, uh, extensions up to six months if uh, the other things that Dr Thompson contemplates, that is a purpose-built centre, was in place, would be beneficial or do you not agree with that? My caution is around whether you are proposing a secure centre for six months, which I would uh, be very cautious about making such a recommendation, versus um, a period of time that is secure with, with a wider range of options that um, may prevent children coming to Cath French and um, assist children leaving Cath French. So this concept of a step-up, step-down model, whether that needs to be built by the Department of Communities or whether we tap into what is being developed around mental health services and around the, the wider sector um, if I could comment on some of those new developments that have been proposed in WA um, that sees Cath French as part of the wider services available to young people, if that's of interest to you, Mr Power? Uh, because of time, I might move on if I may, but uh, you are certainly welcome through your council to, to provide any further information by way of an addendum. Um, but if, I wanted to move on to the issue of um, uh, First Nation children and, and cultural safety. Now, returning back to paragraph 44 of your statement, you'll, you'll see that um, of the 295 uh, uh, children in total, 155 of those, that is 48 plus 107, um, are First Nations children. Um, so it, it's slightly over half of all the children. Now, that's obviously not representative of uh, WA's general population, is it? That, no, no, it is representative of our children in care, unfortunately. Okay. Now, because more than half the children in the French Centre are First Nations, uh, you, you would agree that it's very important that the Cath French Centre be culturally safe? Yes. And um, also a significant proportion of those 155 children ha have come from remote uh, communities, not from the Perth suburbs. Some children do come from off country, yes. Yes. Now, at paragraph 53 of your statement on page nine, you, you deal with where Cass French is um, and you note um, that it has been used for a number of uh, 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 purposes, um, including a government-run reformatory for adolescent boys uh, as a work farm, uh, which closed in 1984, and other earlier institutions, um, such as the Padbury Boys Farm School. Uh, and you note, uh, I, I quote, many Aboriginal children were sent to these institutions and a number have recorded their traumatic and abusive experiences. You, you go on to note that um, the records of the Cath French Centre um, reflect, and I'll just quote, a number of Aboriginal children that have come to secure care have expressed negative spiritual experiences, usually in their rooms, usually from the children that are from other areas of the state. You then go on to say that you invited a, a local Noongar elder um, 
to reassure those First Nations children of their welcome onto Noongar land um, using translators where required and that a smoking ceremony every four years um, or as indicated in response to the spiritual concern of the children. Um, now, firstly, just as a broad uh, consideration, if in a perfect world, the Cath French Centre wouldn't be on a place that had that sort of history, would it? I would agree with you. Yeah. Now, in uh, evidence from the ALS, um, uh, the, sorry, the Aboriginal Legal Service of WA this morning, um, part of what was said was the importance of um, uh, uh, First Nations involvement. Um, has any consideration been given to a, a facility like Cath French being established in either, either or both the far north or the far south of, of WA? And secondly, whether there's any contemplation that an Aboriginal controlled organisation could be funded to run a, quote, remote area Cath French? It, it, and I realise that's two questions, but is, is that something that's in the contemplation of the department? We haven't discussed um, building another centre or having another centre. Uh, part of the challenge in placing a service like Cath French in our more remote area would be attracting workforce. We have significant challenges in our specialty workforce in Perth at the moment, particularly um, in recent times with the impact of closed borders. Um, and um, we haven't as yet talked about having a Catherine Secure Centre run by an ACHO. We have looked at a, quite a number of our other services that are ACHO-led. Um, well, and, and hopefully, obviously, COVID will pass. Um, is it something where an Aboriginal-controlled community organisation um, would be in, first in line should... Um, a, a Cath French type centre or a step up or a step down, as you've discussed, um, to be built? Is that, is that something that, that is in the contemplation of the department? We currently don't have any uh, plans to um, provide to build another facility at this point in time. We are looking very closely. We have um, an ECHO strategy that we are working very actively with our community and our Aboriginal community to um, increase the number of um, ECHOs providing services um, across all our services, both our business services and our out-of-home care services. Now, um, another observation made by the uh, Aboriginal Legal Service this morning um, was that... Uh, ALS saw children in the Cath French Centre being charged with criminal offences for their conduct whilst in the Cath French Centre. Uh, are you aware of that? Uh, in the last five years, we um, understand there's been one instance where a child um, was charged for criminal damage. Um, it was a very exceptional circumstance and it was a number of years ago, um, but certainly we manage most of the behaviour um, within the centre and with our staff and with that um, supportive uh, therapeutic care um, and that we, um, we, we try not to have children charged for um, things that happen at the centre or even in our residential care. But at the can centre, I, can like I, I say... Sorry. Can I just come back to the uh, question Mr Power asked a little while ago about, as I recall it, a step-down approach. Uh, recommendation 8 from that 2019 review recommended additional high support placements be made available to facilitate a staged or step-down approach for selected young people exiting secure care. Has anything been done by way of implementation of that recommendation? Uh, yes, Chair. We are doing work at the moment around expanding our um, out-of-home care contracting so that's part of it. So we want to have a greater flexibility and range for the children at the, um, at the end of children coming into Cath French and who will leave Cath French um, in what um, we, we're loosely describing as a complex care framework. Uh, currently, we have therapeutic high needs, but what we want to do is have a greater flexibility 
in the absence of having that as part of our suite of contracted services, they're about to go out for contracting. So there's been work being done to, in preparation for that. We have responded to individual children. So in the last few years, we've had three or four children to which we've designed an individualised program. Um, sometimes, um, and I think in one case, we outsource this and other times we've set up a, a house where we've got um, our trained staff that work on a sort of a two-to-one with a uh, child and provide that uh, more intensive placement in order to, um, uh, over time, we hope that that intensity can decrease. We've also had some examples where um, we have a mix of our residential care workers and a mix of our social trainers from our disability houses have trained together um, and become, um, you know, co support workers in that model. So they bring the disability knowledge and the child protection knowledge for a child. Um, we've had uh, some instances where we've got very complex children um, with disability as well as care and protection needs and a range of other needs in that mix as well. Yes, thank you. Uh, it might be uh, helpful to put this in context. I think we've established that the secure uh, facility has about 30 separate children each year admitted to it on average. On average, yes. On average. How many children are in care at any given time and how many of those are Aboriginal children? In total WA children in care? Yes. Uh, I can get you the latest numbers. Um, there's a, there was about 5,500. I think we're sitting at about 5,000. Three or four hundred. I can get you the precise numbers. Sorry, I don't have that right yeah. in front of me. Um, it was, was 5,029 on the 30th of June 2018, of whom 2,760 were Aboriginal. So presumably the numbers have gone up by four, five, six, or seven percent. So we're talking here about 30 children out of a population of 5,000 some and some. Roughly 500 That's, years last year. Yeah. I see. So it All is right. a very, very uh, extreme end. This is the most complex of our children, mm. Chair. Mm. I can see that. Um, as you've just said, it, these are the most complex of children in care. Um, it, it, it would be surprising, wouldn't it be, that um, only about 50% of them had a disability of some sort. Um, you'd agree? I don't think our figures show that, that we have 50%. I think Sorry. it's around about 26%, yes, um, sir. which is higher than the our, our, the statistics we have on our children in care generally. This is a, a, a probably twice as high as our general um, rate of children with disability across children in care. Uh, yes, but given that it's the most complex end, it would surprise you that it would be that low, wouldn't it? It depends on your definition of, of disability. Children come with a range of behaviours um, and I'm aware that uh, the Royal Commission has made a very broad definition of psychosocial. Our definition um, is somewhat um, narrower. Um, so it, it does depend on that definition. Certainly all our children that present to us um, do have uh, significant trauma histories um, and significant um, needs across the spectrum. They come with um, potential. Some of them have already got um, psychiatric diagnosis. Some of them don't. Um, so that range of, of need is present um, in the children. Right. Um, in, in the assessment and admission of, of uh, children to the Cath French Centre, um, the, there is a, a role um, to be played by an Aboriginal practice leader. Now, um, what role does that person play with regard to the Cass French Centre? Uh, we have a slightly different title for our newly appointed um, Aboriginal um, support worker, a, a cultural therapeutic support worker, um, was appointed in um, uh, June, June, July this year. 
Um, his role is, is really important on all our um, case planning team um, and our um, uh, uh, engagement processes with the children. And most importantly, of course, when children are off country, um, that person is connecting back to the Aboriginal practice leaders in the district and connecting back to family. That person is also, we um, are very excited, that is building some of the cultural um, knowledge around um, the, the children. Uh, we've also uh, repeated, um, and he's brought in um, some elders to, to restart and relay our cultural practice. Um, so we had a smoking ceremony in August. Um, we see some real development in that role um, as that person becomes um, really enmeshed in, in all the practice um, and building the capability, but we don't see that person operating in isolation. Um, that, that we have a team of all our districts have um, now two Aboriginal practice leaders um, and the role of our therapeutic cultural support worker is working with those Aboriginal practice leaders also both at referral, but most importantly throughout the, the time the child is there and in transition planning, um, because, of course, that's the most important part about um, where the child is going um, and what the child then needs. But meeting some of those cultural um, connections, also connecting us to um, elders both locally and potentially across the state, as is dependent on where the child has come from. All right, so to break that up, is the, the person you're referring to here is somebody in the Cath French Centre. Yes. Um, and are they employed full-time or part-time? Full-time. Okay. And then, if I understand it correctly, in terms of the decision of a, a First Nations child um, entering into the Cath French, French Centre, that is um, the department um, placing them in the Cath French Centre, consultation is made with... Uh, a, a person whose title is District Aboriginal Practice Leader? That's correct, yes. Now, is that done in all cases where it's a First Nations child? Yes, that's a requirement. And uh, in, in relation to that, what, what, what input do they have in terms of that decision? Part of the decision, of course, is making sure that their cultural needs continue to be met while they're at Kath French. But also, um, when we're making decisions about bringing a child off country, their knowledge and expertise is really important about whether this is in the best interests of a child, um, whether there are other alternative uh, placements that might be made locally, or whether there are any other alternative services. So it's it's a, a you know a multi-team approach making those decisions. And for Aboriginal children, an Aboriginal practice leader in the district is really essential. Um, and then, of course, that's part of that consultation when the team are looking at the referral. Um, the therapeutic cultural support worker is part of that um, Cath French uh, case management team that are looking at those referrals. So when a, ref a application comes across your desk as the delegated decision maker, where a child is identified as being First Nations, in all, case, in all cases, is there a section of that form which which states what that district Aboriginal practice leader has said about the application? It may not be as explicit as, as exactly what they said. It's certainly part of the um, part of the narrative in that referral around what um, the cultural issues are. There is a cultural needs section. Um, oh, sorry, it, if it I just pause. Necessarily quote. Sorry, I just wanted, sorry, I just I want to understand this. Um, when you were giving the description earlier, it sounded as if the Aboriginal district Aboriginal practice leader would have been consulted about whether it was in the best interest of the child, whether it was culturally safe, and whether there were other options in a, in an Aboriginal setting. Um, would you agree that that would play a very important uh, part in? deciding whether someone should be removed, particularly from a remote area, and being brought to Cath French. Yes, and that's okay. relayed in the, in the referral. Right. But then you said that it wouldn't be as direct or it may not be as direct as what that person had said. Um, why would that be needed to be um, mediated by some other person within the department? Why couldn't that be directly stated as what this district Aboriginal practice leader had said about those issues? 
sometimes it is quoted more directly. Um, I'm just trying to, I, I haven't got a referral from in front of me um, to look at, um, you know, like sometimes it's because they're written collectively by the district, how that's conveyed. But that information we, we look at and discuss. Right. Is, it, is, it, is there any reason why that, that section, which is about um, getting that input from the district Aboriginal practice leader, is there any reason why it, it, it shouldn't be directly from that person? No, not at all. All right. And is it, is it something that you, the department thinks it should work towards to have that as a, a freestanding part of the, uh, of the form so that you as the decision maker have an unmediated uh, mm -hmm. opinion from, from that person? Like I say, there is a section on, on cultural needs, um, how much it's, it's direct verbatim quote from the Aboriginal practice leader um, varies a little bit, but it's probably something we should look to strengthen. All right. Um, because that person is at least seeking to speak to the cultural needs and the cultural safety of that child within the community of which that person forms part. Yes. All right. Um, uh, in terms of the physical structure of uh, Kath French, um, it, it doesn't look that different from a youth detention centre, does it? It is a fairly stark building. Like I say, the building wasn't, as you've noted, um, is not purpose-built. It is a concrete building and it is quite stark, yes. Um, do you know what percentage of children who enter the Cath French Centre have previously been held in uh, juvenile detention centres? I don't off the top of my head. Okay. Um, I have a funny feeling it's in the evaluation report and I can't remember what that percentage is at this time, sorry. All right, if, if, if it's possible, if, if that could be taken on notice. And is, is it something that would be recorded in the intake? Sorry, I'm, I'm here to help. Thank um, you. If you look at Table 2-4 two, two of that report, you will see that the living arrangement before a child entered the secure care, 39 of the 418 over the 10-year period came from detention, and when they were released, 11 went back into detention. I'm not quite sure how that squares with the principle that they have to be in care before they before they can be sent to the uh, uh, safe uh, or secure uh, centre because if they're in detention, presumably they're not in care, are they? Oh, oh yes. We have children in care who are at Bankshire Hill Detention Centre's chair. Oh, really? Oh, yes. All right. Um, well, that's how we, you've got about four a year on that. that come, no, a bit more, five a year that come in uh, from detention. Right. And so that's coming in from detention but other children, uh, presumably, well, uh, other children presumably have got detention in their his, in their life history, but they may not have come direct from detention. Yes. Um, and do you know whether that figure would be available? That is, how many children, um, whether they've not come direct from detention, but have a, a custodial history behind them before they enter the Cath French Centre? Do you know whether this the figures for the department would? I know Show that. the chair is looking through the evaluation report. I think some of this can be difficult to obtain, noting, of course, that children come into care, they may previously have had exposure to Bankshire. So yeah. the, the data wouldn't be complete, um, and I'm not sure how easy it is to search that data. I know we looked at the sample in Cath French. Again, I can take that on notice to see if we have that information. All right. And, and then linked to... Uh, the chair's question about these these children who are coming directly from custody into the Cath French Centre. Um, how does that occur? Is it that they've reached the end of their sentence um, or they've been released on bail, but the department considers that they are risked under the test and then puts them into Cath French? Is that that's what's happening? That's correct. So a referral can be made if a child... Um, often it's because they've been in Bankshire Hill for a short period 
that there's been real concerns before they went to Bangsha and the concerns around their risky behaviour has continued while they're at Bangsha. So therefore they may meet that criteria um, and we would then admit them in. We, we do have a, um, a very clear uh, test and we, we make sure that it isn't for further detention. It is because we, con we consider that at that point in time, there is uh, the immediate and substantial risk. Okay. Now, uh, you said that the department is strongly opposed to um, essentially a court or a, or a mental health uh, tribunal making a precondition of release, whether on bail or on some other order, that they go to the Cath French uh, Centre. Now, I bear in mind that it is the department's decision um, as to whether someone goes in or not. But why is it uh, an issue? It's not the court making a decision they go into the Cath French Centre. It would be the department. Um, but why is it a problem for, the, for a court or a mental health tribunal to say, we've run out of options, but if they're in, put in the Cath French Centre, we'll allow them to be released from custody? Why is that a problem? We see that as a conflict between the, the criminality and, and the test of whether a ch uh, child is safe to be in the community versus the legislative threshold around admission to Cath French. Um, and when I was talking about the health, mental health, it was about mental health services, not necessarily a mental health tribunal, but where a child needs to be discharged um, and is seen um, fit to live in the community, then we can make an assessment about placement at Cath French. If a child still has health needs um, or mental health needs, we need to make sure that they are stabilised before we can admit to Cath French because we aren't a service that, that you know, it's not a detention centre and we aren't a mental health service. So we, do, we aren't able to, um, you know, have a child who has very high levels of health needs or acute um, psychiatric needs that need uh, mental health services. Well, let's put aside the mental health uh, side for the moment. Um, a, a child who is being held in detention, oh, sorry, I'll, I'll start again. It, a, a child who's in the Cats French Centre, it, is it correct that if they may be on bail for criminal offences. That's not a disqualifying feature? No. Okay. You're correct. So um, if a child is being held in a youth detention centre um, and an approach was made uh, to the department to say uh, that 21 days would be a circuit breaker um, and would... Uh, the court has determined that after a, whatever period the department deems suitable to be in the Cath French Centre, the person will be released on bail to return to X place. Um, why is that an issue? Why, why, that doesn't hamstrung, that doesn't prevent the department from exercising its discretion. Why is that circumstance a disqualifying feature? If the only presentation is that a child presents with criminality or risk to others, that is not the criteria for admission to Cath French. So they're separate criteria. If the child presents a risk generally to the community, um, then it's up to the criminal court to determine whether that child can be released on bail. Um, for us, we then, if a child, if the court then says, yes, the child is going to get bail, we then will make a determination if a child meets our criteria, because we have ongoing concerns or we have a new concern that there is a, um, immediate uh, risk of substantial harm to the child to the child themselves. So that's how some children can come from Bankshire. Yes, um, you would understand, I assume, that bail orders are often made on a provisional basis. Bail is granted on the condition that a person surrenders their passport. Bail is made on the condition that they... Uh, live at a approved rehabilitation centre for a period of time. So bail could be made conditional upon uh, being placed at the Cath French Centre. Now, if that condition's not met, the, the, the child stays in custody. But why is, it, why is it an automatic bar that that possibility is removed for a child who is in custody? 
I think, Mr. Power, the answer to your question is in the policy on ch children entering secure care. If you look at page three of that document, which is behind tab 41, the volume two of the tender bundle, we see that there are a number of grounds upon which it is not appropriate to place a child in secure care. The fourth of those grounds says, for punitive purposes, or as an alternative option for children remanded in custody. I would read that as preventing the admission of a child into secure care as a condition of the granting of bail. I may be wrong, but that's the way it reads to me. And, and that's a, a policy decision, is that correct, uh, Ms Calders? Yes. And that policy could be changed? Uh, yes, I just need to consult whether it's also in ledge, but it is currently a policy. And right. partly because we see the uh, care and protection needs of the child being separate to their risk of um, criminal behaviour, which is the decision by a criminal court. Yes, but the test under the Act is immediate and substantial risk of the child causing significant harm to the child or another person. So the two things can, can be concurrent. If the child presents only as risk to others, that is not reason for admission. That is part of, um, we believe, the child then falls in the um, space of risk of um, criminality. And so um, is it correct that on occasion there are grants of bail made by a, a judicial officer with a condition that um, a, a child be placed at Cass French for the period of time um, that the department considers appropriate, but the department refuses to act upon, it just simply refuses to deal with that so the child remains in custody? In the situations that we've faced, we have negotiated with the court that that is not a condition of bail. No, but this is, a, I'm suggesting there are cases where a court has made such a bail order and the department in, role, in its role as the carer of, of the child has refused to sign the bail undertaking uh, and act upon that. We haven't, think, had, we haven't right. had that situation arise, Mr Power. Right. It is it, all right. Um, I I note the time. Um, I uh, just have just a couple of uh, more uh, uh, questions. Um, um, uh, in terms of uh, facilitating vi visits and connections uh, to culture. Um, if a, a First Nations child is brought from a remote area, um, what provisions are made whilst the child is at Cath French for 21 days or 42 days to have contact with either their parents or their kin or siblings? What, what, what steps are taken? Uh, first and foremost, that's something that we seek to address in the referral both how contact is going to be maintained as well as part of our transition planning so that that's part of what happens while they're at Cath French. Sorry, I just um, apologise. I just want to make clear. My, my question is about while they're at Cath French because right. um, I'll yes. start. Is what, what uh, steps are taken whilst they're at Cath French? So, again, the team work closely with the district to make sure that, our connect, that the child is connected to family um, or to carers and or carers, depending on um, who's significant for the child. Children are able to receive visits. But, of course, one of the things we've found with COVID is that it has become harder. And, of course, if a child's off country, noting the size of our geography, um, every endeavour is made to connect um, with family. And part of our um, therapeutic cultural support worker is to ensure that that is happening um, throughout the time the child um, is in um, Cath French. Okay. Now, just, with respect, that's very general. What I'm asking is um, if someone is from the remote north or the remote south, what steps are taken to ensure that that 21 days 
that the child is in Cath French, that they have contact with their family or other significant kin. So, so are we talking, we're talking video links? Are we talking oh, some sort of funding arrangements for the family to visit? What, what, we, we would do phone calls or video links depending on what the family has. Um, either can be arranged. We have a video conferencing facility where the child can connect back to district, their family can come in. Often enough, it's phone calls that children make to family. Okay. And it's not infrequent, isn't it, that these, the, this small, most complex group that end up in Cath French are, by the time they reach there, um, estranged from their family, possibly living on the streets? Some children are. Yep. Um, but a number of children do, still do have carers and um, wider family that they are connected to. Yes, um, and exactly. But the point I'm making is that in those cases, wouldn't it be very important to have that physical reconnection where possible between the child and their family, that is bringing their family physically to the Cath French Centre? Where family are able to, we facilitate that, and family do regularly visit. Usually when I'm there, some child is having a family visit. But we are a very large state, and enabling that can be quite difficult. Your family okay. are there. Um, and, of course, with, with COVID, we've had quite periods of time where, where people couldn't travel within the state. Um, and where we can facilitate that, we do. Okay, and do you facilitate that by providing financial support to the family to come and visit uh, their child in the Cath French Centre? Uh, I'm not aware that we have a specific fund, but again, that's something that's negotiated with the district um, sure. and depending on the needs of, uh, depending on the um, connections to, that are able to be facilitated in that short period of time. Well, ha has do, that these, do these same issues arise uh, with respect to Aboriginal children from remote areas that may be taken into care one way or another and placed uh, outside their uh, own country? We work very closely and facilitate funding for travel back to country. It's part of something that we, we regularly do. Sometimes yeah, my, my, my point is this is not something that's unique to the no. secure care centre. It's something that applies to uh, Aboriginal children in care, presumably, across the state and in many different circumstances. It does, Chair. It's the time frame that sometimes makes that difficult. Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, three weeks uh, is not a short amount of time for a, for a child, um, particularly if they've been estranged from their family. Do you think that the department should make it a priority to try and have a physical reunification of the family, if that's possible? Where, if that was able to be facilitated, noting that some of our families live very remotely, so even travelling to a regional centre can be challenging. Um, do you think there should be specific funding available for that to occur, including meeting accommodation costs in Perth? We do have funding available for family. And how frequently... Have you observed or how frequently has the department seen uh, physical uh, reunification of, fam of children and families from remote regions in the Cass French Centre? I can't give you that figure. Noting, of course, that it depends on which part of the, um, you know, where the child is as part of um, concerns about safety for the child as well. Yes. I can't give you the number of children from remote families, but I can tell you that um, family do regularly visit. All right. Um, thank you, Chair. I, I note the time. That's all the questions I have. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll ask my colleagues whether they have any questions. First, Commissioner Galbally, do you uh, have uh, any questions of Ms Calders? Um, I'd be really interested to receive the, the detailed step-down material and the new initiatives that you spoke about in relationship to mental health services for youth. Thank you. We can provide that. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Mason, do you have any questions of uh, Ms Calders? Yes, thank you. Uh, and thank you for your evidence this afternoon. Uh, just a couple of questions. Um, I was interested in the therapeutic care services, the sanctuary model you mentioned around Cornell University. Just interested uh, in relation to 
uh, First Nations experts um, providing feedback on that model in terms of appropriateness for First Nations children in that that type of environment. Uh, I just to clarify, uh, Commissioner, the um, Cornell model is the therapeutic crisis intervention. So there's two models that work side by side. The sanctuary model provides us a framework. Um, and our uh, practice tools and the way we engage and attempt to de-escalate uh, crisis with children is the model that's developed by Cornell. Um, we, I'm not aware of any specific uh, validation with um, Aboriginal children um, or, uh, from an Aboriginal perspective. Uh, we do use both these models in our residential care and we work closely with our Aboriginal practice leaders to ensure that um, the application of those models takes into consideration the cultural aspects of children and part of that engagement um, because the framework is quite high level um, and um, really encourages uh, the connection to the child and, of course, um, cultural connection is such an important part in, in strengthening cultural identity. So that's that's um, an important aspect we have in the, in the actual application, um, but I'm not aware of any um, cultural research that's been done on, on those models. And, and who would be, uh, in, in your view, the appropriate experts to do it? Um, for example, First Nations psychologists or psychiatrists or social workers, who would be appropriate to do that research? All of those um, people, Commissioner, depending on which aspect that they're looking at. Um, and um, we certainly do send our staff off to, uh, you know, to training where it's available, like a number of our, um, particularly our specialist practitioners and our um, culture support worker undertake Tracy Westerman's, um, you know, Aboriginal mental health training. So we seek to connect those those concepts and models within our, our practice. Thank, thank you. Um, just la uh, last one, Chair, uh, Mr. Powell, and his uh, questions to you um, talked about cultural safety. And um, I was interested in your statement at 53, talking about the history of the facility there in Perth um, and particularly the connection with Sister Kate's in Parkville. Can you just explain to me what that relationship was? It says the centre is built on land that was originally connected to Sister Kate's Parkville site. Do you know, do you know that history? I don't know it very well. There is a, a wider history. I understand there was a um, uh, potentially, um, uh, I'm not quite sure what the word is, but a, a location where uh, it may have involved uh, stolen generation children. Um, that's, that's an older history. Um, you have the information there, um, but there is, uh, as it says, a, a history for people who've had um, negative experiences on that um, yes. site and in that building. I, I was interested in... Uh, because that, that, that particular paragraph is loaded with cultural significance, psychological significance. And that last sentence says, the centre conducts a smoking ceremony a minimum of every four years or as indicated in response to spiritual concern from the children. And to me, I, that would see a definition to me of cultural, a cultural location which is unsafe for children in high levels of trauma. And it, and it has a reputation because you've got elders involved in smoking and it's ongoing. Yes. And, and what are the concerns about that history, but also the way the history is now interplaying with children and another generation of children that are in out-of-home care? Um, is... is is that something which is of concern to the department and particularly to those that work there in the centre with the children? I think it's an ongoing dialogue, particularly for um, our Aboriginal people that we have working there um, and seeking that advice about how we manage that. And any plans of moving? Uh, uh, Mr Powers talking about different sites, but even that place with all of that history. 
um, because there's significant trauma with all of the previous um, iterations of institutions there on that particular place in Perth. I, I take what you're saying on board, Commissioner. Uh, we don't, at this point in time, have a specific plan. Um, we are certainly, um, it's part of a prioritisation around um, different uh, homes that may need rebuild, but it is certainly, I think it's an important point that I shall take on note as well. So thank you for mm. your... My, my, um, I'm, I'm originally from Western Australia and was born in Perth and grew up in Kalgoorlie. And as I read that section there, and, uh, it just reminded me of, of an example uh, of... Uh, if we if we used a similar example of Rottnest Island Aboriginal mm. people being taken there in the 21st century as a, a new institution for incarceration, we know that history of, of Rottnest Island, so we know this history, mm. and we need to move away from it. So, but thank you very much for your response. Thank you, uh, Ms. Coltis. Thank you for your evidence. I'll just inquire, Mr. Bitter, your position is the same. I take it you don't have any questions. Uh, for Ms. Coulters? Uh, that, that's correct, Chair. Thank you. There are a number of matters that have been taken on notice and Mr Power referred to an addendum. Those are matters that will be considered. Yes, I think the best course for that is uh, for there to be consultations between the Council so that uh, the information that is needed can be uh, refined and made specific and then uh, responses can be provided uh, on notice in, in, within a reasonable time frame. Thank you. Uh, I take it then that no, but no other council or representative have, has any questions of Ms Calders. And on that basis, thank you, Ms Calders, for your evidence. Thank you for coming to the Royal Commission and for your statement. Uh, we appreciate your assistance. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. We adjourn until 10 a.m. tomorrow. Uh, perhaps before we do that, uh, Mr Crowley, you might uh, give us a little preview of uh, tomorrow. Yes, thank you, Chair. So tomorrow... We will have in the morning a continuation of the focus of the Secure Care uh, and the Cath French Service from the WA perspective with Dr Kelly Thompson, the Assistant Director of the Cath French Secure Care Centre, giving evidence. Uh, we will then be shifting focus to the Northern Territory and we'll have evidence from uh, Mr Nick Espy, from the North Australian Aboriginal Justice Agency, following which we will then have uh, Ms Jeanette Kerr from the Northern Territory Department of Territory Families giving evidence uh, on behalf of the MT government. Yes, thank you very much. And each of those uh, witnesses has provided a statement? They have. Yes, all right, thank you. All right, we'll adjourn then until 10 a.m. Uh, tomorrow, uh, straight and Eastern Standard Time. The Royal Commission into Violence, Abuse, Neglect and Exploitation of People with Disability is adjourned.